Council workshop to order. It's May 17th, 2022. If you'd stand for the pledge in a moment of silence, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Mr. City Clerk, can we have roll call of the City Council, please? Mayor Rose. Here. Deputy Mayor Young. Here. Council Member Bentley. Here. Council Member Dittmore. Here. Council Member Bachelor. Here. Council Member Frampus. Here. Council Member McDowell. Here. Great, great to have everyone here tonight. The purpose of tonight's workshop is to talk about initial projection of fiscal year 2022-23 revenues. Again, as you know, no decisions will be made. This is just to talk about our projected revenues. Mr. City Manager, I'll yes, turn it Mayor, over. Yes, Mayor, Member City Council, uh, we have a half hour here for this uh, revenue projection workshop, and then we're going at 6 o'clock to... Uh, see the initial uh, draft uh, community redevelopment agency budget and then our regular meeting at 6.30. So uh, first wanted to start off by uh, a short review of our previous two budget workshops where the council established um, some uh, priority budget goals for us to work into the budget. So the, the first ones are from the um, April 5th workshop and the ones shown in red are the ones you added at your uh, workshop on April the 19th. So one of the things we talked about at the first uh, workshop was wanting to do a, a system-wide uh, park system master plan uh, with some specific improvements that should be considered, including a new spectator stands for the skate park, a development of four a new pickleball courts, development of a replacement dog park, adding uh, parking at selected parks, a development of a uh, jogging, walking trail, which could uh, possibly interconnect between parks and develop a, of a new senior community center. Um, so that was the, the, the first item. A second item was uh, more maintenance oriented, but to improve the maintenance of our parks. So to budget and perform improved maintenance of our parks uh, again, specific ideas uh, the council suggested for improved maintenance is play equipment, repair and replacement, uh, ball field maintenance at Clements Wood Park, Field of Dreams play surface repairs, and replacement of the ceramic uh, fixtures in the West Brook Park West restroom uh, with stainless steel fixtures like we did at uh, Clements Wood Park. Uh, also, improved grounds maintenance, so to budget additional uh, dollars and to perform improved maintenance of the uh, landscape trees at the I-95 and US-192 interchange. Uh, to start to take action on the fire alternative study, uh, so we're expecting that study to be completed this summer and then as may be determined by the council to start to take some actions towards implementation. Council specifically mentioned the, the potential of purchasing property for a new fire station, so uh, locations, uh, selection, and potential purchase. Uh, in terms of sustainability, uh, to create a sustainability advisory board. Uh, council chamber upgrades to budget for and perform some selected upgrades uh, in this room, such as lighting and audiovisual improvements and relocation of return air from behind the, the dais. Uh, Henry Avenue guardrail completion, so to include in uh, a project that's budgeted um, new guard railing along Henry Avenue that can't be installed uh, while the existing water mains is in place, but after it's abandoned, we can install the, the missing reach of guardrail. And the last one from the first workshop was to uh, maintain the current city manager off staffing level in the proposed budget. Then these were the ones that were added uh, at the last uh, workshop. Um, so uh, to uh, consider adding a position uh, specifically uh, for the space code Field of Dreams um, in the Parks and Recreation Department in order to promote the use of that facility by 
special needs organizations and individuals sort of a little uh, back to the future, try to get back to uh, its an original intention. And so uh, we've got some assistance from the um, Space Coast Field of Dreams board uh, in uh, suggesting that, that and uh, our human resources directors actually worked on uh, with some assistance from one of the board members, a uh, job description, classification, and so forth. So we're including that in the proposed uh, budget for next year. Um, then sort of modify some of this building, but there was some discussion about wanting to consider the development of a new council chamber. So uh, we put that in the, in the mix. Um, there was a discussion we want to budget for and install improved crosswalk visibility for the uh, Henry Avenue crosswalk. So we've incorporated that into the draft of the budget. Uh, there was discussion at the last one about uh, see if there are any opportunities for some additional street sweeping. So we'll look at that program and see if we can suggest some uh, improvements, some changes there. Um, I think the mayor said we should start planning for some additional roadway improvements. We have several in the hopper, under design, out to bid, bid awarded, not yet uh, contractor mobilized, but to, to sort of start the next round of roadway improvements. Uh, mayor also suggested a comprehensive review of our municipal code. Um, we update it from time to time in different sections, but a more more comprehensive look to see if we can clean that up. And then, uh, again, I think this was also a mayor's suggestion, a, a really good one, is to start planning for their future replacement of the wastewater treatment plant laboratory and office building. That's an old house, and it's outlived its, its expected life uh, and then some. And so uh, a good suggestion, uh, space is at a premium there, and we've got some new space uh, off of um, Park Hill, and so we have opportunity to, uh, to, to do that better. So those are the ones from the last two workshops. The purpose of this workshop is really say, what are our revenues that we, oh, sorry, Mayor, yes, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, before you go on, <clears throat> I know these are 15 different bullets, but we really hadn't had a chance, and I'm sure we don't have a chance tonight to really go through these and see which one of them, which ones of these we want to move forward, or do we want to add other, other just because somebody threw it and it's, it's stuck? I don't know the consensus of the council. Do they want to do these? Is it something we want to do this coming budget year? Or that's a great concept, but we might want to wait till the following budget year. So, and people might have other ones that they've thought about. So, I know we're running out of weeks and months for the budget time, but we need to probably hone in on some of these a little more carefully. And, uh, Mr. In particular, I think uh, we're going to have uh, Mr. Rohde come with a workshop uh, specifically geared to the new building department, building, council chamber, that kind of thing, so we can flesh out that in more detail to get a better sense of, of the council. And I think that's scheduled for your June, I can't tell you what, I think it's the June 21st First. meeting. 20, okay, so we'll, we d definitely know we need to get some more clarification on what the council desires for that, uh, and there may be some others, as the mayor indicated. Right, we can incorporate all 15, if that's okay, Mr. Rohde, thank you. Um, <laughs> into one building? Yeah, <laughs> into one concept. Uh, Mr. Frampus? I agree, Mayor. Um, I mean, I had some questions on the the added position we want to put on the Space Coast Field of Dreams. I'd rather encom encompass the whole park and not just the Field of Dreams park as, for, as far as promoting maybe something in that, that the large field over there, which for concerts or something, it might not include the Field of Dreams and, you know, expand a little bit more on that. So I'd like to have a little more conversation on some of that stuff yeah, for I sure. I think all these need some more, but I think that's that's what I'm talking about. Let's get it out there so they know what we're looking for. Okay, so in terms of what are our abilities to fund some of the desires of the council to incorporate in the budget, I wanted to go through the, the revenue forecast. I put a, a fairly detailed 
uh, description of the economic environment we're in. Um, clearly, the national economy, the world economy is slowing, and uh, but I'm, I'm suggesting that we're still going to see modest growth in city revenues, not like the growth we're experiencing in the current budget year from the previous federal stimulus uh, of significance and the Federal Reserve policies being uh, extraordinarily accommodative uh, to try to deal with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, but uh, almost every economist is projecting a slowdown, if not a uh, recession uh, in the relatively near term. So projecting a total revenue growth of about 2.1%, uh, totaling 43.9 million. So where the council has the most discretion uh, is in the general fund. Um, those are for any of our lawful uh, municipal government expenditures, uh, projecting a 6.2% increase there, increasing about $950,000 to 16 and a third million. So we won't get the property appraiser's initial estimate of taxable valuation until next month, but so this could change, but I'm projecting about a 4% increase uh, at this point to about 5.16 million. We'll know a lot more because that typically that June estimate from the property appraiser stays quite close to the final estimate we get later in the summer. So that's a, that's an estimate. Uh, franchise fees, I'm projecting to increase about 3.5% to 2.17 million. Uh, ut utility users taxes uh, project to increase 3.9% to uh, three and three quarter million. Uh, licenses of permits to decline about 17%. Um, our building permit uh, revenues have fallen pretty dramatically uh, since since uh, 2021. 20, uh, um, and so it's, it's projected that we're going to continue to have a slower development and growth um, with, the, with the sort of peak housing and, and uh, economic uh, uh, slowdown that we're anticipating. Um, so about 900,000 in licenses and permits. A good portion of that is uh, uh, business um, tax receipts uh, which are very stable, um, but the uh, building permit revenues uh, really fluctuate considerably with economic conditions. Uh, intergovernmental revenues, uh, we're doing extremely well with intergovernmental revenues from the state of Florida this year. The expansion really got pulled forward by the federal stimulus and the Federal Reserve and Florida has benefited dramatically from that. And so uh, it's a 21% increase over budgeted, but it'll be less than that over what we're actually going to get. Um, we're, we're really receiving. Now, those revenue estimates come from the state in July and August. So the ones we got last July and August um, very much underestimated what we are taking in right now, which is a good problem to have. Uh, charges and services essentially flat, a uh, quarter million dollars. Uh, fines and forfeitures, not much more, 3.4%, uh, 123,000. Uh, large increase in interest earnings um, uh, to about 100,000. Um, our funds are invested in uh, money market type accounts, uh, very short term, highest quality. Um, we, we follow state statute and are very conservative in our investments. So what we don't keep in cash in the banks um, we invest extremely conservatively, but uh, with the Federal Reserve in the middle of a rate hiking cycle, we're expecting a, a more than doubling of our interest earnings next year. And then miscellaneous revenues, those are primarily end up being sort of insurance, um, reimbursements and other things that are, are not classified, so about 113,000 uh, relatively flat, a decline of 2.2%. And then uh, non-revenues, uh, about uh, $50,000. Um, so that's the, that's the general fund, which uh, so will be a, a pretty good year next year. Um, even with potential for recession, 
if you think about a major source like the property tax, those valuations have already been set as of this past January 1. So even though we won't receive the first um, revenue until the end of December, um, the values are already set. And so a lot of local government revenues trail economic conditions. They aren't leading indicators. They aren't even concurrent indicators. They're typically lagging. So we have time if indeed we end up in a recession, uh, the time to really adjust to that will be in the following budget year that these revenues are, are like I say, local government revenues tend to trail general economic conditions uh, re reasonably significantly. In terms of other funds, uh, recreation fees, uh, we, we are pretty sure we're gonna get one uh, developer payment and, and uh, possibly more depending on how fast um, a couple of those projects move forward. Uh, then we have uh, stormwater assessment revenues, uh, 621,000 and there's where we have uh, two and a quarter million in grant uh, reimbursement revenues from a couple of different stormwater grants, uh, which is a priority of the council to try to improve the stormwater in our uh, older neighborhoods that don't have uh, modern drainage. So we're, we're very aggressive in trying to seek grants there. Uh, the um, city and county contributions to the joint redevelopment uh, agency are each projected at a little over a quarter million. This will be the first year that we actually see a decline in revenues for the agency. Uh, we formed it 10 years ago and it's been increasing every year but uh, starting a year ago in January of 2011, many of the properties in the project area had been reduced by the property appraiser um, with more and more people buying retail goods uh, online and um, uh, having it delivered to their homes. Um, a lot of those uh, brick and mortar retailers um, asked for the property appraiser to reappraise their properties and that was accommodated. So not seeing the valuations yet until next month, but I, I'm fairly confident we're actually gonna see a reduction in revenues for the redevelopment agency. Scott, can, can I go back one on the stormwater? Sure. Mm -hmm. I know we've been in the red a lot on that because stormwater costs a lot of money to maintain and develop. Uh, and we just can't raise those rates. And as we all know, that's a number that's below the line that has to go to every, advertised, I think, to every house. The direct mail to every property owner that owns property in the city if, if there's an increase proposed. We did an increase in 2018 was the last Yeah, month. 2018 or 19, I think you said, let's look at perhaps uh, the validity of increasing that or uh, I think most people pay $20, $30 a year. So yeah, it's based upon your property. If it's a house, it's it's there's a it's an, it's a benefit assessment, and so it, it's based on how much benefit you receive from from this. And so, commercial properties typically end up paying quite a bit more than residential. Um, so the time frame, if there is a consideration of uh, looking at the possibility of increasing that rate, is kind of now. It, it's a long lead time to get to a public hearing that every property owner gets a direct mail notice. It's a, it's a pretty significant undertaking. We get some help from the county, but it also involves a significant amount of staff time. It involved a lot of my time back in 2018. Um, so if there is council consideration of looking at an increase, we are slightly lower in our rate than the unincorporated areas that are nearby us. Um, so it wouldn't be outrageous to, to at least match what our neighbors are paying. Um, but it's a lot of effort and we'd hate to, to spend that effort if, if there wasn't sort of the, the will to follow through and the room is as last time, full of people and some people, you know, living on fixed incomes, even five or ten dollars a year, you know, can be a big deal to them and they get that direct notice and they're here. So we, we certainly could look at that. Um, it's not my suggestion. We have come out of the red and now we're in the black, barely. We are 
taking advantage of grant funds that are out there. So um, we, we are looking to get the, there's a, a decent possibility of having a direct legislative appropriation if the governor signs the budget and doesn't veto that particular line item. So we can do the near-term projects. It's, it's a great question, but it's a significant undertaking and, and sort of would want some direction from you know, a majority of the council if, if you want us to do that or, or we could certainly gear up for that in, in you know, 2023 uh, might be my suggestion. Just a couple follow-ups to that. Government's job should be to control you know, roads and water. And I know that's been one of the big issues. We have a lot of older subdivision that, that flood. And uh, so I think this needs to be a council priority. It's not pretty when it does flood. And I think the time before 2018, what was it 15, 20 years before you? Yeah, it was, it was 1990. So it was, yeah. it was 18 years. 18 years. Great changes. Raised it. And again, nobody wants to pay more taxes, but Nobody wants to be flooded out either. So I know when we build new developments, we go to the nth degree to make sure that they meet all the codes and they're not flooded and we don't have that water going on somebody else's property. And I think, uh, as you know, we spent millions of dollars just making that big basin to help some of the developments and from the older developments for the runoffs. And and a million dollars is, that just, I don't even know if that does the engineering on most of these projects, much less do the project. So it doesn't matter to me if we do it this year or next year, but I think it should be in one of those two years. Um, I know it'll be a lot less work for you next year than it will be this year. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I, I'd be happy to give some uh, unpaid free consulting advice since I, I did this in 2018. And if, if, if I can volunteer to do that, Next summer, I'd be happy uh, to do that. Eric, you get that in the minutes, please. Uh, Mr. McDowell. Thank you, Mayor. I just had a, uh, in that same line of questioning, I'm looking at the storm water funds, and maybe I'm reading this incorrectly. It's showing, actually, the taxes are not where they were from prior year. We're actually down by almost two points and we're making it up through the hurricane expense and reimbursement is what it looks like. Yeah, we had a, a partial reimbursement um, because of protective actions we took um, on Labor Day weekend just before Hurricane Irma. It was a serious rainstorm and we lost the Dairy Road culvert and completely washed out Dairy Road, but it happened the weekend before Irma. So all the work that we did in that week to protect property owners from further flooding, knowing that Hurricane Irma was coming, that portion was able to be reimbursed. And so because we spent both that dollars and the actual replacement of the culverts out of the stormwater fund, uh, we put those revenues uh, in the fund, but but those that was one time not recurring revenue. Our I'm supporting, I'm supporting the idea that maybe it's a good time to. Oh, sorry. So I'm just supporting the mayor's comment about maybe it is a good time to look at that. So because it is down. So let's yeah, the the the, the the tax revenues or the or the assessment revenues are. I'll call it relatively flat from 1990 to 2018, and then in 2018 we increased the rate, and so you'll see that we're we're just just right around 600,000 on the top line of that uh, uh, estimate, um, which again it only increases because we're adding some parcels that are developed that that are part of the the benefit assessment. So. Um, Council policy, you know, to prepare for that in 22 or, or 23, again, out of a budget of something like $2.8 million, you know, a 10% a increase is $60,000. You know, you kind of have to decide how, in the long run, that's very valuable. In, in one particular budget year, doesn't really give you a lot. But I, 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 I think it's a good idea um, the question is, 
timing as a lot of things in life are timing and, and uh, would look to the council if you if you want us to do it this year it's, it's a significant work effort if you want to give us direction to go forth and, and do that next year then we'd that already be part of the work plan for for 23 23 24 mr. Francis I agree, Mr. Morgan. I don't believe we should rush into it. I don't think we should. I think we should take the time, do it properly, take as much time as you need, know that you're going to have to do it next year and, and just plan on doing it for uh, 2023 uh, for the following budget. So um, that that's what I would support. Thank you. Continue. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good question. Um, so uh, moving on to our capital projects fund, uh, that is uh, the corpus of that is from uh, development impact fees uh, that we have an agreement with Brevard County. They collect it on our behalf and then it gets allocated to different road projects. We have three of those that are funded and in process. Um, obviously, until we get those dollars allocated and come to us, we're not getting new revenues other than the interest earnings on the declining balance as projects are, are developed. Um, the county does have some funds on hand that will need to be allocated, but um, we don't put those into the budget until we actually get that allocation from the county. So we have to amend the budget during the course of the budget year because we get new capital for specific uh, road improvement projects, then we'll amend the budget at the time. But it's it's speculative to try to do that um, before that that uh, agreement is reached. And, and those always go both to the county commission or the city council for, for approval. Um, water fund revenues are projected to increase 3.9% to uh, 7.65 million. Uh, sewer fund revenues, uh, which include uh, two grants totaling two and a half million, uh, our projected increase 3.9% to 9.11 million, including uh, two and a half million in grant funding. Uh, American Rescue Plan Act revenues are projected at 6.12 million, which the second tranche of funding is expected in October, and interest earnings uh, on the declining balance as projects are uh, constructed. So, in summary, uh, my uh, revenue forecast at this point uh, preliminarily is 43.87 million. Uh, this includes uh, four and three quarter million in grant revenues from grants that have already been awarded, projects well underway, an estimate of how much we can draw. Most of our grants are reimbursable as expenses happen. So if you have a public works project um, that say cost $3 million, you might have a hundred or two hundred thousand in a particular construction draw. Um, typically, we submit that on a quarterly basis to the granting agency and get reimbursed. So, we budget on a cash basis. Um, we report our financial missions on a on a in these funds on a modified accrual basis, but we budget on a cash basis. So, some of these grants we know are going to extend into fiscal 23-24 just because the projects are so significant they can't be constructed in one budget year. But uh, that's a pretty significant amount of grants for an agency our size and requires a significant amount of staff work um, and consultant work to meet all of the grant requirements. Um, so overall, that's about a $920,000 increase over the currently adopted uh, revenue budget of just under $43 million. And again, that's a 2.1% uh, increase. Um, so we'll come to you with, as we get some information from the county property appraiser and the state, some modifications, but for the purposes of thinking about what we can afford to do in next year's budget, this is probably a pretty good starting point. Um, I just had a couple of comments about, uh, we, you talked about the R word, the recession, and also you kind of blew over the fact that we don't really need to worry about it because taxes are paid in the rear. Well, if we have a bad year in the future, the following year has to be worse because taxes are paid in the rear. So how do we keep ourselves in above average shape just in case everything really goes south? 
That's a terrific question and, and one that the, this council's been particularly good at for the last dozen years and, and more since you've been here, Mayor, longer than that, is to be cautious with the use of the public's dollars. Uh, don't overspend. Save and be ready for that rainy day. Uh, we've got a good uh, reserve um, in all funds but the stormwater fund. That's, that's a positive fund balance but not a real large one. Uh, the general fund is very healthy. Um, the water sewer fund is healthy. Um, the special revenue funds are, are in good shape. Um, so having those reserves can carry you through those down years without necessarily have to cut services to the citizens and businesses. So you've done what a lot of cities don't do is to save for when the economy goes south. And uh, that's a great position to be in. So I, I give a lot of credit to, to this council and the councils that preceded you for being cautious with the use of public funds so that when it gets tough, uh, you're not facing the, the really service cutback decisions that some other cities do when they, you know, as soon as they get a dollar, it's burning a hole in their pocket and they want to go use it. You've always been cautious with the taxpayer's money and, you know, for, for my money as a resident of West Melbourne, I think that's really a good way to be and I think most citizens would would feel that, that they've been well served by their council that's, that's very conservative with the use of, of their funds that they entrust to us. Yeah, I'm sure all of us want to keep it that way and give our uh, residents a, a better than average return on their investment, for sure. Yeah, I think I think we've been able to achieve that in the past, and, and you're right, the goal is to continue that going forward into the future. Okay. Uh, we do have a speaker card, Nicole and Jason Kanicki. Come on up. Hi, I'm Nicole, and this is my husband, Jason, and we are speaking here um, on behalf of our friends as well, Anthony and Arlene Palermo. We are all West Melbourne residents. Um, we're happy to see that pickleball has made your budget consideration. That's what we're here. We're pickleball enthusiasts. We have been using these lined courts that are here on the property. Um, actually, I think we've been using the tennis courts for pickleball since before they were lined. Um, and we've noticed a real growing interest in the community. We're not the only ones coming out there anymore to play pickleball. Um, especially over the past couple years, we've really benefited from the mental, physical, recreational um, benefits from this sport, which seems to be catching on. And uh, we'd like to share that with our community. I think that it would be a real hit. Um, again, I was really happy to see that it's already um, on your list of considered items. And so we just want to support that wow. um, you know, in the near term, if possible. And um, also just wanted to mention for consideration that the lighted courts do offer um, you know, a wider range of uh, accommodations for people. Not everybody can make it during the day. Sometimes it's too hot to play during the day. And this sport does attract a wide range of age groups from I've seen teenagers to seniors and um, all different athletic abilities. You don't have to be an athlete to play, but people who are athletes enjoy it as well. So thank you. That's, that's great. I mean, I went to New Tamar Beach and I played some this weekend and I'm just a beginner and I'm not very good. Uh, but it's a lot of fun f for all levels and I hear over there talking to some of the, they had a bunch of tennis courts and they converted it to f four pickleball and they wish they had more because they have these tournaments and people want to come all over to just play. And uh, again, like any age group, they classify, I don't know how they do all that stuff, but it's, it's, it's fun, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point that you mentioned, um, the dedicated pickleball courts. Um, you can fit four courts on the size of one tennis court, and I think that would be a huge benefit to have dedicated pickleball-only courts. Yeah, I, I agree. Mr. Bentley is a, think is a renowned pickleball player. And, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> well, something to talk. For you guys done, I didn't want to interrupt you guys. Uh, we just, as an FYI, converted one of our tennis courts in our neighborhood to pickleball, and it's a different dynamic. And, you know, a lot of us older folks really enjoy playing pickleball where we have no chance of getting out there and playing tennis uh, in real life. And, and the fact that you can play four on a court really makes it better because you should do even less running. And, and so, 
you know. <laughs> and so the mayor's been on at ours, and I can tell you he's right. He's not, he's not lying about not being that good. <laughs> but, <laughs> the record again. Are, so I, I, and I'm worse than he is. So, uh, But it's a lot of fun, and, you know, I'm excited that the city's now going to look at making those courts. And, and I, I think we'll get a lot of community involvement and, and interaction with it. Also, Mayor, I wanted to make a comment on, you know, the budget stuff that, you know, Mr. Morgan's walked us through there a little bit. Can I, men can I sure, make a mention on the pickleball uh, thing before Francis, you move he wants on? To comment, I guess, on you guys mentioned the lighting in the pickleball. Uh, are you saying you... Okay, so you are using the lighting. You know where the switch is at and all that. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you knew. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there goes that budget again. Gee, <laughs> 24, 25, we'll get it in there. Really? Ah, oh, nice. We don't know anybody from Sawgrass yeah. Lakes here. <laughs> the forgotten community. Yes, Mr. Bentley. Yeah. Uh, also, I wanted to mention on the, the financial loan that, um, you know, we did roll back taxes last year. And yet we still put the city of West Melbourne a couple of million dollars in the bank in the general fund. And, you know, I, I, I do agree that council's had some, some obviously some uh, involvement in doing that. But I think Mr. Morgan's been a godsend since the day he got here in the sense that if you look at our budget over the last, I don't know, six or seven years, I, I believe every year we put over a million dollars or something much even more than that. Uh, into what we always refer to as a rainy day fund, and and I and and I can tell you we've done the same thing, and he's done the same thing on the police pension committee, and there's few, if any, cities in the financial condition that West Melbourne is in, in the state of Florida, and and m maybe even much broader than that. So I want to make sure he gets the credit that I think he's due for his leadership over the last 12 years plus, or however long it's been since he's been here. We, you know, we know he's retiring here later this year. But I've seen such a night and day difference in this city since the time that he's been here. And so I want to thank him for his leadership and, and commitment to that and, and just the fact that we would not be where we are today without his contributions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Anything else for the good of the group? Then we'll recess this meeting and then we'll start our CRA meeting, Community Redevelopment Agency meeting. Thank you, building officials. <laughs>
Mayor, what am I like to call the West Melbourne Vard County Joint CRA meeting to order? It's May 17, 2022. If you'd stand for the pledge in a moment of silence, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Can we have a roll call of the board, please? Chairman Rose. Here. Vice Chair John Dittmore. Here. Board Member Danny Bachador. Here. Board Member Pat Bentley. Here. Board Member Daniel McDowell. Here. Board Member Stephen Frampus. Here. Board Member Andrea Young. Here. Board Member Christine Zonka. Uh, Board member Zonka has notified us that she will not was not able to attend tonight's meeting. So can we have a motion for uh, excusing her? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Bentley? I make a motion that we excuse her from tonight's meeting. Mike's not. Uh, Mr. Dittmore? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. I'm sorry, who said nay? Mr. Francis. Motion passes six to one with Mr. Francis voting nay. All right, so our first item of business is approval of the minutes from March 1st, 2021. I believe that should be 2022. Yeah. yeah. What's a year? Uh, Mr. Dittmore? Make a motion to approve the uh, minutes from the March 1st, 2022 meeting. Thank you. Mr. Bentley? Second. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Item number five is 2022 20, 23 Joint West Melbourne Bavard County CRA budget and work plan. So, uh, one of the requirements of the redevelopment agency is to send the draft budget uh, to the city council and to send the draft work plan to the county commission. So, this item serves those uh, two purposes. Um, the uh, proposed appropriations uh, total $105,800, which is essentially the same as the current year. Um, we have $100,000 uh, to uh, repay. Um, it's the um, third to last payment on our initial loan to the agency um, to start up operations and then uh, some minor administrative uh, costs. Uh, there is an estimated reserve of just over 400,000 and that would be proposed for future year land acquisition along both the Ellis Road and US 91, US 192 corridors in accordance with the agency direction uh, last year. Um, again, as I mentioned during the city council uh, budget workshop a little bit ago, um, I'm projecting a uh, reduction in contributions from the city and the county on the basis of uh, declining taxable valuations within the project area and a uh, presumed uh, rollback rate for the city. As you recall from the 2018 interlocal agreement between the city and the county that reduced the county's contributions towards the agency with the savings being applied to uh, road projects in the city limits of West Melbourne. Um, the county contribution is the larger of 50% of their otherwise tax increment um, or the city's contribution whichever is higher. It, it's been, the city's contribution has been higher for each of the years since that 2018 interlocal agreement. It's possible that the county's contribution for their 50% uh, may end up being larger. Um, again, we'll know significantly more once we get the property appraiser's um, estimate, which comes next month. Again, there's, there's not a lot of expenditures in the draft. Um, we do have to 
pay $175 and file a report annually uh, with the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. Uh, we are proposing to uh, be a member of the Florida Redevelopment Association, which provides us with a great deal of information, including compliance with all of the new state statutes for reporting, which increase about every year. So good value for $625 uh, to make sure we stay compliant with state statute um, through reminders from the FRA. Uh, then we have a, uh, this will be the third year of a required independent audit of the agency. We used to do that as part of the city audit and the city budgeted for it, but um, this will be the third year that the state has required a separate um, audit even though we have very few financial transactions. So that's an audit fee. And then again, um, the $100,000 uh, scheduled loan repayment to the city that'll fall due on April 1 of next year. And at that time, the balance will just be $200,000. And then uh, the reserve as directed by the board last year would be split evenly between uh, future property acquisition along Ellis Road and along US 192, one of the authorized purposes remaining under the 2018 interlocal agreement is for stormwater improvements that support uh, redevelopment activities. And so we have opportunity both within Ellis Road and 192 to acquire some properties, typically a lot or two behind the frontage of the major corridors that uh, could serve as stormwater as, as uh, properties are accumulated for future redevelopment. And so uh, we think that's a good uh, decision by the board to uh, split those reserves into the two target areas and suggesting that we'll probably have enough to really do something of significance in 23-24. Uh, we'll have saved up enough over the last three years to, to make that uh, something of significance. So. That's uh, my report to the agency board. Be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for city manager? All right. No. Mr. McDowell? Yeah, just a real quick question on this, because um, I honed in on that 55 strategies in the master plan. Are they all done? Are we finished? Are we close? No, and the 2018 interlocal agreement greatly restricted that. So even though you can't do projects outside of the project boundaries, you can't do projects that aren't listed in the plan, the 2018 interlocal agreement restricts it much further. And so our, we have uh, more limits by interlocal agreement between the City of West Melbourne and Brevard County Commission. And that's absolutely correct. Um, we started off with those 55 strategies, and that's how we, you know, started doing the, the lighting. Um, but at some point, just like with the comprehensive plan, we could certainly revisit, you know, that document and make it match more of what the county, you know, actually had us agree to. It just hasn't been revised, but no, that Mr. Morgan's absolutely correct. They don't match. Uh -huh. Ms. Young. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, can we go back to the Ellis Road for just a moment? The, um, the, um, we will be asking the surrounding um, other, like the county and the city of Melbourne, if they would like to put matching funds in with that as well, so we can really do something with Ellis Road, since we're 11 million short. Yes, we have that ability, uh, again, and, and almost all of Ellis um, is in the, the frontage pieces are in the redevelopment project area, so that would be an opportunity that we could contribute. So obviously for the council, road improvements are a high priority. Again, what the county is doing with the savings from the 2018 agreement is restricted to road improvements in West Melbourne. And then the opportunity to partner um, on Ellis Road, particularly with respect to properties that are have a, some take and opens up some new frontage parcels for redevelopment. I think we've got uh, some good opportunity there. The city does already own a very small kind of worthless parcel 
that ends up being part of a stormwater pond, and so that will be coming to the city council um, at a later date. F thought is proposing to acquire that as part of the site on the north side, fairly to the east of the project area, but there's a large stormwater pond where there is uh, some uh, manufactured housing current and the city owns a small sliver there that's really kind of undevelopable, but um, it's something that FDOT needs, and now they've got several acquisition agents actively working to acquire property there. So uh, this gives us an opportunity to, to partner. Thank you. So that worthless piece of property that you speak of, <coughs> are we gonna sell that to, as part of our uh, contribution yeah, if we donate it, then we certainly would get credit as part of our match um, for whatever value the state would place on it. it it's going to be pretty low value. It's it's a very small strip that's really only has potential use to the immediately adjoining properties and nobody else. Uh, I guess the value is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, I noticed that you didn't really answer her question concerning Melbourne con contributing to this roadway. Have you had any discussion with them or is that? No, but uh, certainly um, the county uh, government is, is in this big time. Um, they are serious partners with FDOT in this and so one of our other local governments is, is contributing dramatically towards this. Um, Melbourne has some property frontage on there and, you know, just as, as we're being asked to help, I'm sure Melbourne's being asked to help, but I, I certainly can't speak on their behalf. Okay. You'll keep us informed. If... Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Okay. Uh, anyone from the public wish to address city council? Seeing no, none, we'll close the public part and we'll adjourn this meeting. We'll start the next meeting at 6.30 sharp.
part of the meeting earlier, so we just gonna we adjourn that uh, uh, for a few minutes, and we will get right into the next meeting here. So, if any, again, if anybody wants to address city council, there's speaker cards by the front door. If you'd fill those out and give it to Eric, and he'll pass them down. So our first item of business tonight is a presentation to council member Daniel Bachelor. Daniel, can you join me up front here? Good deal. Well, as many of you know, Mr. Bachador is, uh, this will be his last meeting as he has taken a job out of state, and uh, we're going to truly miss your wisdom, and uh, I'm sure all the citizens, residents of West Melbourne uh, are going to miss your uh, representing them, because I think you've done a great job of representing them, and uh, I, I don't even know what to say, because You've just been a good council member, and you're a quick learner, and you you made us all kind of think outside of our comfort zone sometimes, and that's good and healthy for all of us. So on behalf of the city council, I'd like to give you this plaque, and this is from the city of West Melbourne, presented to Daniel P. Bachador, council member 2018 through 2022, and appreciate for your outstanding and dedicated service to the city of West Melbourne. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would you uh, give us some words of wisdom? I would, yes. <laughs> It'll be short, I promise. So I would like to um, thank the residents of West Melbourne for entrusting me as a city council member. Thank you to my fellow council members for their collegiality and for considering and respecting the perspectives that I have tried to bring. Thank you to all of the city staff for their professionalism and expertise. And I wish you all the very best as West Melbourne moves into a new era because there will soon be new city management. Uh, there will soon be a new council member. Um, there will be water independence with the appropriate amount of fluoride. Yes, you promise? Yeah. <laughs> and there's going to be an updated comprehensive plan. So there's certainly a lot of work on the horizon for the, the city and for the council. But I'm confident that the city will continue to excel uh, and be a leader in the realm of local government because I think we have all set an, an example uh, for the rest of local government to follow, not only in Brevard County, but as in the state as a whole and it's it's been an absolute honor and privilege to serve as a city council member and i am proud of the city and what it has accomplished over the recent years and it has been incredibly eye-opening and incredibly rewarding experience um, and i wish the next person to be sitting up there all the very best so once again thank you for everything and i look forward to seeing how west melbourne proudly moves forward into its exciting and challenging future thank you Gonna stay the rest of the meeting now. <laughs> good, good. All right. Uh, our next presentation or um, thing that we're doing is interview with applicant for the board of adjustment. Who's taking that? Okay. So, tell us about yourself, your name, and anything you want to. And then. Yes, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. My name is John Carey. Um, I was inspired to uh, apply for this position um, because I was at the last of the um, Citizens Academy courses that your staff put on. It's an excellent course. Um, and one of the things that your city clerk discussed, as well as your planning director, was the need for people to serve on these boards. I initially dismissed the idea because, as you uh, may or may not know, the these boards, you're considered an officer under the state constitution's dual office holding provision. 
and I'd been selected by competitive bidding process to be the special magistrate for St. Augustine. So I, I kind of dismissed the idea of it. Um, I got a call from the staff person up there, and they're not even going to be standing up that board until 2023 uh, sometime. So uh, it gives me a, a window of opportunity where I could serve without being an officer somewhere else. I do want to be fully upfront with all of you uh, right now so that there's no, um, you know, perception that I wasn't fully um, honest about this. Once I do take that position, I will have to resign. So I'm not committing to a full term, and, and I need you all to understand that if it affects your decision-making process. Um, as far as uh, my background, you know, I don't want to recite my resume. It's all in the packet. Um, but, but I did have a bachelor's degree in geography and planning, a master's in uh, public administration with an emphasis on urban and regional planning. And as uh, you may know, I serve as a local government attorney. Um, I represent the City of Cocoa Beach's Board of Adjustment as their attorney. So I sit in Morris's seat over there. So, uh, you know, I think I have a little bit of knowledge about the process and, um, you know, we'll apply the uh, facts of any given case to the, the city code. And, um, you know, I don't have an agenda. I just want to be able to serve the community while I can. Well, Mr. Carey, uh, your uh, resume and, and all your background is just perfect, I think, for this job. I think your perspective will uh, help carry out the mission of the city and I support you. Yeah. Available for any questions if you have any. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll take a seat, I guess. All right. I just Mr. Like Bentley? to see that Sawgrass has taken over, so yeah, I'm yeah. just saying. <laughs> Motion, yeah. How Thank you. Uh, yes, we have a motion if you would. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Despite being from Sawgrass. <laughs> no, I'm kidding with Steve. Um, I make a motion that we accept this gentleman as the representative on the board that he's requested to be on, Board of Adjustment. And that's it, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Frampus. A second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you for volunteering. We appreciate it. Thank that. you. Next up, we have a couple of public hearings while she's getting that uh, loaded up. Our first public hearing is revisions to Chapter 71 of the Natural Resources and Stormwater, Article 4, Landscaping and Tree Preservation. Okay, for the record, I'm Christy Fisher, the city's planning director, and I'm gonna be presenting um, this agenda item, number 7A, about the Landscape and Tree Preservation Code Amendments. I do believe um, you may have a few speaker cards on this at the end too, Mayor. All right, a little bit of background about this. Um, August 17, 2021, we had a special workshop um, with council, and at that point, um, council, a number of council indicated to staff that we should strengthen the landscape code based on some of the clear cutting of existing trees at new apartment sites and uh, some of the other clearing that's occurred uh, throughout the years where it doesn't seem like they're um, is sufficient replacement or in, in some way um, saving preservation of existing trees. So the last time, the second bullet is the last time that we revised the code was in 2013. Um, third bullet tells you that this is applicable citywide to uh, various projects, multifamily, mixed use, commercial, industrial, and institutional districts, um, and the types of uses that are allowed in those zoning districts. And then the last bullet um, tells you the strategy that I employed, which was to you know, get a landscape architect consultant, SNME, as well as a four person guiding committee to review the consultant's pr proposals. We had five or six meetings, a couple hours each. So we went through it you know, quite a bit to get to where we're, where we're at. Um, in 2021, there was some discussion on these four points that there didn't seem to be a tree code at all. The answer wasn't true, um, but then this code change does you know, build on some of what we had and, and has um, some other factors that, that will probably help the city. Low tree bank contribution answer the, uh, you know, we always had a formula for the tree bank. Um, really, it, it's my policy, my perspective that it's better to have the trees in the ground than to have them into, you know, a tree bank that might be used future time. So that, that's partly why you don't see, you know, a, a very large number in that tree bank. 
Um, but we will be coming back to you all probably in the next couple of meetings with a fee resolution change, not just to this part, to the tree bank, but for some of the other development review fees too. There was some confusion as to whether single family residential lot landscaping will change. I believe the Home Builders Association guy is here today. And the answer is that no, we're not changing the criteria. In fact, we're expanding. Um, we had some uh, warning about citrus trees. Now we're allowing fruit trees to be counted as tree. Um, but they, those trees do have to be eight foot tall. So just a slight change. Um, administration and enforcement, there's always been provisions in the landscape code, I believe, you know, even back to the 80s and 90s. Um, gaining compliance is challenging. Um, so we will certainly work on that, you know, as we go forward. So our approach to the landscape code is to, you know, kind of do three things to enhance the current tree and landscape requirements to save more trees and get bigger new trees. Uh, second bullet is to change the code based on our implementation over the last nine years with some clarifications and images, and then we talked about revising the fees. Um, the image on the right is a, a recent site plan that you all looked at with, you know, some of those green bubbles represent some of the saved trees. And there is also in the city's website a manual of acceptable plantings, which is um, the guide that citizens and developers, et cetera, have as to what types of trees we allow on these developed sites. And that list is pretty extensive. It's got, you know, at least 47 trees. But the last time that was updated was 2009. So that will be coming to you all with a resolution in the future, too. I'm not going to read A through L, but again, this is what the current code contains, you know, and there are changes that are made to this list. Um, that's essentially what you see as Exhibit A, the attachment to the ordinance in the red strike through and blue underline. At least I hope it appeared that way in, in the copies that you all saw. So the first set of changes, we did some tweaks to the survey and the survey requirements for trees um, that are on existing sites. The tree replacement, the table, and the size um, has changed. We'll go into that in the, in the next slide. Minimum tree requirements, and so now we're requiring some diversity, a canopy, and if palms are used in some of the landscape islands, there'll be more of them. Um, State of Florida has a list of invasive nu nuisance trees, and you know the State of Florida really urges local governments to have those trees removed in its you know corporate city limits, um, so that you don't ha continue to have that issue. Um, but as you know, you know, getting rid of Brazilian peppers is probably going to be a forever thing of trying to do that. Uh, tree permit requirements, you know, we updated some of those to clearly state that no tree permit needed for single family residential lots. We always had a, a statement in there, but there was some contradictory language, so we just cleaned that up. All right, so on this slide, this is about the tree replacement and sizes. A table up top um, is straight out of the code now. So again, it's the current code. And it's got those four categories, those four rows. And it tells you what the tree sizes are and what, how many trees you have to replace. Um, and then the tree replacement size at the, at the time that we're you know, leading up to now was two and a half inches. I thought it was two inches. It was, it was two and a half inches. Um, what we're proposing to do is a table on the bottom. So that's why I drew a red line through that top table. So the proposed table is one where you have a few more itemizations of different categories. Like we start at four inches up to, but not including 12 inches, you replace with one tree, you know, 12 inches up to 18 inch, two trees. And then we really jump because we really felt, you know, the committee and the, the people that, you know, we had on the team that at, once you get to 18 inches, it's a bigger tree. It's something that, you know, you need to you know, replace with more. And so then that was bumped up um, to four trees. And then the next sort of row is 24 inch diameter breast height. And by the way, um, sometimes people ask me, where's that measured on the tree? And an existing tree, where's that diameter breast height? And I don't know if you remember in 2021, I showed a little image and it showed four and a half feet. So 54 inches above, above the ground which is different than where new trees are measured. They're usually measured anywhere between four and six inches above the ground. So it's a different wording and different way of measuring. Um, and then the, the most notable thing is that, 
you know, you'll notice that last row we say if you're if you have trees that are 36 inches and above, um, no longer is it going to just be four trees. It's going to be an inch per inch replacement. Um, so what that means is, let's say somebody removes a 36 inch, you know, tree, and the trees are required to have be at least um, three inches in size to replace that. Then you'll have multiple of those trees in order to eat that to equal that 36 inch oak, or whatever the tree might be that you know is a protected tree. And, you know, the reduced re tree requirement, um, there, I was asked this in an email earlier, but not directly, so I'll try to answer it, is that, you know, if the development site cannot accommodate additional trees, a waiver can be requested. But that's at staff's, you know, discretion. It's not something that's automatic. Um, and, you know, there, there would have to be extenuating circumstances as to why they couldn't because there's, you know, other ways to get to some of this and some of those ways are to make the replacement trees even bigger than three inches, to make them a four inch or to make them, you know, slightly bigger. Um, so, like I said, that that's something we bake into the code as sort of just in case. This audience, uh, this slide is mostly for the audience to show that you know, the different size trees and what the trunks look like. So being on the left-hand side of the screen, you have eight inch oak all the way up to the right-hand side of the screen where you have, you know, 42 inch oak. And I know it's a little bit blurry, but that's a pretty massive trunk. So it's taken many years for that oak tree to get to that size. Okay, moving on to the next set of, of revisions. Um, the tree replacement table, we talked about the sizes, you know, the three inch, um, number two, there were some changes in floor statutes, and uh, Mr. Richardson will let us know in case there is something, you know, that we've missed that isn't consistent with floor statutes, but I believe we are now. And then number three, there are some additional things that we did about um, tree canopy and diversity, so that'll be the next slide. Number five, landscape buffer requirements, you know, have some additional criteria and clarification based on the last nine years of implementation. So when I say nine years, it's since 2013 when we did the last code revisions to the landscape code. Um, number five, I, we talked about a little bit. Number six is we already have tree information uh, in landscape, whether it's shrubs or, or grass or whatever, about installation, irrigation, and then our inspection when those projects are new. Um, we've augmented some of that. And number seven, the landscape maintenance criteria was also augmented. And number eight is that we added uh, related to sustainability, and so the city, you know, being a part of, of taking a look at our part of sustainability. Um, there's a section now about low impact development, and so that's like a bonus section that developers, if they did use that, could get you know a little bit of bonus from that. Um, and number nine has to do with some images that we will have in the code as a result of these changes. So the first one, canopy and tree diversity, and that first bullet is really where we think we're going to get, you know, some more trees being saved. And remember, you know, when, when I had the landscape consultant, um, landscape architect consultant, they've worked all over Central Florida, so they had, you know, that experience. Plus, I had the, the local landscape architects who were familiar with the surrounding local governments and what they had. And so... It was sort of the consensus that if you require something like this, 10% of the canopy coverage um, be preserved if there's existing trees on site. So that 10% is of site area. That was a question that I got to. It's of site area. Um, and then if you have new plantings, that's the second bullet, then 50% of all new plantings on site must be native. And again, that's more in line with sustainability and some of the other you know, notions of of having it be, um, you know, less intrusive into what wood is, was there originally and naturally on the site. And the third bullet, 50% um, of required trees to be medium to large at maturity. That has nothing to do with the eight foot tall and three inch caliper. That has to do when that tree is fully grown. That may of acceptable plantings has three different categories of trees. It has a small, medium, and large. So then the developer, landscape architect, civil engineer, whoever's designing that project would go to that table and then pick you know, a tree from the medium or large category instead of a small tree. So an example of a small tree would be a crepe myrtle. So 50% of that developed site 
you know, is supposed to have the medium to large trees so that they grow a little bit larger. And then we have a tree diversity table. So again, this is the expertise of, you know, people like landscape architects who say, you know, you really need to bake into the code something that talks about tree diversity, which makes sense to those who know about different pests and different trees, that you don't want to just have one type of tree species on a property. You want to have several so that if a pest comes in, it doesn't eradicate all the trees. We did include three images. I'm only showing you two. Um, the, the image that you should see at the bottom left is number two, the shrub height and opacity, and that has to do with ongoing discussions that we have with different folks who implement um, some of this in their, their landscape plans and actually planting um, at the development site. So that hopefully will clear up some of that discussion that we seem to have. And then number one, landscaping around edges of parking lots and along property lines. So that's another image. I didn't include it here, but what I did include was the third one for the landscape islands, one on average of every 10 parking spaces. I believe you'll hear a question about that. Um, but what we we're showing here is that, you know, when you have properties that are less than five acres, um, it makes sense to have a smaller island, so maybe a 12-foot wide island. Right now the code says 10-foot wide, so this would go to 12-foot to allow a little bit more room for some of those trees. And then if you have properties that are five acres or larger, that those islands should be at least 20-foot wide. Now, in our code, we also say that if you have parking spaces that are only 10 foot wide in width, um, then you only need to have one, one island for every 15 parking spaces, and this changes it to an average of every one for 10. But that average, using that word, gives a lot of flexibility. And so the example I give is if you have in a parking lot where maybe at the 11th parking space you have an island, but it's being used for the fire hydrant and the fire department connection and some other utilities, um, well, then you would allow them to have a, a true landscape island somewhere else down the line. So that's what the word average means. Uh, so in conclusion, I believe we've accomplished council's request to have more tree replacement requirements and to give a minimum for tree preservation, the 10%. We didn't have a minimum before. I believe we do balance against market and development rights and that this is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan private property rights element. We did do as council had suggested and included a section on low impact development landscaping. We've included some images for commonly asked questions and updated the landscape code. The last bullet is just to let you know again, that manual of acceptable plantings, the 47 list hasn't been updated since 2009. We will get with professionals and, and make sure that, you know, we've got an up-to-date list and I already know a few things that we're going to, you know, include on that list. Um, another comment that came up today in, in some of the discussions with council members are, is about the effective date. So traditionally, with code changes, the effective date is upon the second reading of the ordinance. You know, what, what I'm asking is that the effective date be based on the first reading of this ordinance. So today, May 17th, not June 7th. That's when the, the second reading will be. Um, as stated, this means that any project that was not submitted, has not submitted final site plan as of tonight would have to comply with these new codes. So that means projects that are already submitted to the city as final site plans, they're already using the older landscape code. Well, if, if you all pass it tonight, that would be the older landscape code. Um, single family lots and new subdivisions such as the dunes, so that's that new project DR Horton is building, you know, west of I-95 off the St. John's Heritage Parkway on the east side and north of US 192. Um, they would have to comply with that provision to have a slightly taller tree. I think I explained to some of you all those trees that nurseries are sold in ranges anyways. So it would probably just be that range of tree from six to eight foot. Um, so, you know, it's not really going to be a big change to them. And then, you know, the city attorney and I discussed this a little bit. You know, he can uh, tell you a little bit more about these dates and what that means legally, but if you all agree with this, then, you know, we would include this effective date in the ordinance, so that that would be one of the changes to the ordinance. Um, the Planning and Zoning Board, as your local advisory board, they also heard the same presentation. They're just advisors, just as I am, to you all. 
Um, they recommended on May, uh, May 10th that you all approve this first reading of ordinance number 2022-09, revising the landscape and tree codes for tree removal, preservation, and general landscaping. And then, you know, I've put in um, that last phrase with a revision to section six, effective date of that ordinance 2022-09. Um, City Attorney, I don't know if you want to read the title or talk about the effective date. I can do both. I'll read the title first. Ordinance number 2022-09, an ordinance of the City of West Melbourne, Brevard County, Florida, amending Chapter 71, Natural Resources and Stormwater, Article 4, Landscaping and Tree Preservation, Division 1, Tree Preservation, Division 2, Tree Removal and Replacement, and Division 3, Landscape and Buffer Requirements, updating the landscape and tree codes, providing for inclusion in the code, severability, conflicts, and an effective date. As far as the effective date language, actually the effective date would still would still read the date that it's adopted on second reading. Uh, but in Florida law, there's something called the pending ordinance doctrine, which means when there's been a public announcement that a, uh, a code change is underway, that code change can apply to uh, applications and development orders that are done from the date of that announcement forward. Typically, though, you want that public announcement of a pending ordinance change to be specific enough to put the community on notice of what it is they're going to be required to comply with. In this case, council announced months ago the intent to make some landscape code changes. There wasn't a lot of specificity even out of our workshop as far as specifics of, uh, you know, caliper measurements at, at DBH and, and things like that. Uh, that was all developed through the process Christy described with the consultant and um, the steering group that shaped this. So I, I think a compromise to be fair would be to have this uh, apply not as of the date council announced its intent to make changes, but certainly if this is approved on first reading, the development community is aware and has fair notice that any applications received after today's date would be subject to the new rules, assuming that they are adopted on second reading. Do, does that make sense? So essentially someone who had their final site plan application in prior to today would be vested in the old rule. But if, again, assuming this is approved on first reading and eventually adopted on second reading, anyone who puts an application in for final site plan after today, it would be subject to the new rule, even though the effective date wouldn't be until second reading adoption. Is that clear enough? Yes, it is. Thank you. Do we have any speaker cards? Mr. Bruce Moya. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council. My name is Bruce Moya. <clears throat> Norma, I'm here as a president of MBV Engineering, but Actually, I'm here representing the, uh, I'm the Government Affairs Chairman for the Home Builders and Contractors Association, as well as the um, Business Advocacy Chairman for the Chamber of Commerce. <clears throat> We've been pretty active uh, when new ordinances come around at different cities in the county that affect development, um, <clears throat> because whether some of the development community knows, a lot of the development community does not know this is even happening. Um, it's always a big surprise. Uh, we usually get our clients say, when did that happen? How did that happen? I just did a project in the city of West Melbourne. Now I got to do something completely different. My costs are going up. Everything in the paper, we're talking about affordable housing. This is really adding another cost to developing property and selling um, residential property to the end user, which is the buyer. Um, not a big fan of... Uh, tree ordinance change. Um, I don't know if it's really even necessary in your city. You guys see every site plan now that comes through. The last site plan we had come through here for that um, for the legacy apartments, we modified that plan at least 10 times just to work around the trees. And now we got to, we might have to redo the whole thing again if you guys pass this ordinance because they don't have a formal site plan submittal. They've only got approval from the city council. So if you adopt this, we're back to square one. And I don't think that's fair. I, I would hope that this board would at least, if they choose to adopt this, allow that those projects that you guys have approved to be grandfathered in. Because that's a lot of time and expense 
just to send them back to the drawing board. Um, I'm not really sure what prompted this because your staff does a bang up job when it comes to protecting trees, especially knowing that they're coming to you to look to, to vote on. Um, that's like the number one thing that we look at before we even bring it here because we know it's important. Um, and I think that the codes that you have now are sufficient. Um, I guess really, should you choose to pass this, because I don't know how many people are for this or how many people are against and how many people are here and aren't here to speak for or against it, is we would recommend that most of it seems okay. I would recommend that you don't do the 10%. I think that's the biggest hit. I don't think it's necessary. Um, so that would be the number one thing. The number two thing would be to uh, grandfather in those projects that have been approved by this board already. And um, the third thing would be um, to allow a kind of a, um, if, you, if you decide that you want to do the 10%, and I saw this in another ordinance, and I really appreciate the fact that Chris did reach out to some local landscape architects because I think they have some really good stuff in here. Um, if the developer so chooses to preserve a certain amount of his property, that he would be exempt from additional replacement of trees. Uh, they did this in, um, I believe it was Titusville, and that was a really heated one. We were, we were, we were doing that one for a couple of years. And if they, so they set a number that said if you do 10, then you have to add maybe 5% more, 10% more to get to the requirement. But if you chose to preserve 15%, you're done. You don't have to do replacement requirements. So uh, I, want to, I would love for this board to consider just those three. I want to keep it simple because um, I know there's a lot of different uh, uh, parts to this and um, it does get kind of confusing on what is uh, really you know, good and what is just fluff. So uh, those are my three concerns and my three uh, uh, proposals for you to consider and uh, I'm here to answer any questions if you have them. Any question for Mr. Moore? Is it more? Hey, Bruce, could you just recite that again for me one more time, the three things? I don't want to just jot that down. <laughs> Number one would be not to do the 10%. Okay. Do everything else but not the 10%. Okay. Um, two would be to uh, grandfather those okay. projects that have been approved by the city council. All right. And then three would be if you do consider the 10%, to also consider a, mac, a, a, a preservation number, maybe an additional 5% that would, that, would, uh, that would exempt you from the tree replacement requirement. So you're not adding on top of, you're not, you know, so if you're rewarding somebody for preserving a lot more existing trees and not penalizing them for taking out the ones that they can't protect or preserve. And how many projects are you aware of through the home builders that are pending right now Sure. Well, I mean, I'm sure Christy probably has that answer, but I mean, how many, how many? What do you mean, how many projects? How many projects are like, like you said, the grandfathering? How, how many does that affect right now? Um, he's concerned about the legacy apartments. Well, that's legacy. And that's the only one, really. Excuse me. That's the only one because, you know, the epic apartments that you all remember is next to Promise and Brevard. They're almost at final site plan approval. So I would tend to agree that that one probably shouldn't be, you know, required in the 11th hour to change its landscape plan. But really, the only residential one, if that's what you're concerned about, would be that one. We've got some other commercial ones that are sort of in the hopper that are also closer. Um, so, you know, the way I look at it is anything, obviously, that would get submitted, let's say, tomorrow. Um, and I know he's focused on the residential, but it would be, you know, any industrial, institutional. So the city gets in all kinds of site plants. So anything new obviously has to do that. And like I said, the only question is those that are almost at final site plan approval, what do you want to do with it? And, you know, legacy apartments, if that's one that you kind of want to carve out, I guess, you know, ask Mr. Richardson if there's a way to do that. So it, well, I'm just looking way. at I, my concern is for everyone to understand is that I'm just concerned about them investing money, time and money in this and have to go back to the drawing board because it's not fair to them uh, and because uh, uh, I don't know what that cost would be. But we shouldn't, uh, I don't think we should be doing that. But um, okay, well, th thank you. 
I did one there was sure, go ahead. project too that is maybe it's not all the way into that process, but did you have some, some master plans that are in the process? That no, have been in this? we don't. That's a, that's a issue of discussion later on. Okay, well, I mean, yeah. you have some projects that have been master plan approved, and that would be. But the landscape plan was not a part of those master plans. I understand. Plans approved. Just saying. All right, thank you. Uh, what, Mr. Uh, Francis. I don't know what the effect on this in this case is? We, we won't know numbers because they don't know how many trees. Mr. Francis. Thank you, Christy, for putting this together. You guys did a lot of work on this, and uh, I, I, I like the new plan. Um, I, I like uh, also the, you know, starting the effective date, like you suggested also. Um, can you talk a little bit about the softwood versus hardwood? Because I know you uh, changed that a little bit, and soft, more softwood's included in the plan now than it was before. Is that right? Um, they no. They considered the, the same, 20, basically? In the 2013, we really didn't. It was just staff was allowing the softwoods, the pine trees, those are the ones that most people talk about, more so than the palm trees, um, to really not have to be replaced. So we sort of made a decision that we wouldn't do that. I mean, it's it's pretty clear in our manual of acceptable plantings, unless you all want to take you know, pine tree out as a tree that could be planted, which also means that it would be a tree that they couldn't use you know, in, in any of their landscape drawings and that we would have to say, well, it's not in our list, so you don't have to replace it. No, I, I that think it should be part of the count. both ways, yeah. It's part of the count now, right? So. It is. That's it. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Dittmore, anything else? No, I'll just wait for you to close. Okay. Then, does anybody else in the public wish to address City Council? Then we'll close the public hearing. Mr. Frampus? Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we approve the first reading of Ordinance 2022-09 um, with the provision that we... Uh, uh, except the effective date being as of the first approval. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Dittmore. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to second it. I just have discussion. So, Mr. Bachador. Second. Uh, Thank you. Any discussion, Mr. Dittmore? Thank you, Mayor. I, I, so, the couple of concerns I have on this is, I mean, my memory's not all that great, but. I just remember the one person that came in out of the 28,000 people we have lived in this community, the only person I remember walking in here complaining about this was a lady that did not live in the city. She lived actually in the county. And then all of a sudden we seem to be jumping through hoops to, to get this done. Um, I don't object to a lot of this because I like some of the ideas about putting fruit trees in instead of some of the other things. Uh, I think some of that is actually pretty good. But I think we still we only have 20% left to, to, to this build out it seems like that we have some projects that are already in the in the hopper, so to speak. And my biggest concern is that we um, that we move forward and it costs someone additional money to go back to the drawing board and, and do something. So since I've been on this council, we've, we've always kind of shunned the um, these things that we're looking for a problem to fit a solution. And, and when I say that, I know we've had some issues with some tree clearance going on that wasn't supposed to happen, but then that seemed to have morphed into this, let's go back and do these changes. Um, I like to see positive changes that are positive um, for everyone, just not for the residents, but for the, 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 uh, the business owners that are actually trying to finish the development here. It should be kind of, we should marry that up as much as possible. I don't see uh, the 28,000 people in this community. I don't see a lot of people complaining about the way some of the communities look. Everybody seems to be pretty happy about it, and our staff does a great job with that, and and the, and they do hold the the, uh, the builders accountable. So my so it you know, and I can only hope that we could probably amend this a little bit to to meet the business owners uh, a, a little bit halfway, and and do some uh, striking some of this out uh, so it could be a. a it could be useful for everyone. Um, as it stands like this, I, I won't support it as it is right now, but I would support it if we were willing to uh, make some amending to, uh, to, make, to help out the, uh, uh, the builders. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bentley. Thank you, Mayor. 
Yeah, I personally, uh, as John said, I think there's a 20% or something like that left. I'm okay with making it more distinctive than the first 80% that went out just because, you know, it's a precious resource. It's, it's low in uh, supply right now. And, uh, you know, I want to keep our city one of distinction. And if this adds to that, more power to it. I don't want to be unfair to somebody. And, and so that part does worry me if there's an unfairness aspect. So I would ask our city attorney, you know, um, the gentleman just presented one uh, argument there. Does he, have a, does he have a good argument there? Are we being unfair and unjust? Because I do trust your judgment to say, you know, we wanted to push for today's date on this, which I'm fine with, but in this case that he's describing, that's just not right to do someone that way. And if you tell me that, then I'll, I'll say no. If you don't, I'm, I'm going to support it. I would say generally that I would disagree that um, there's some kind of prejudice created between with a change between initial and final site plan based on landscaping and tree details because that is often subject to change in that time period. I would give the caveat that I wasn't involved in, you know, the, the administrative site plan review other than for legal. So I don't, I don't know how much back and forth there was on tree preservation issues for the legacy site prior to initial site plan, and I don't know how much it would be anticipated that would it, have, it would have to change with final. My, my guess is the, the difference would really be in the sizes of trees placed. My guess is that they're, they probably already meet the 10% canopy, but you know, Director Fisher would have to answer some of those questions. Yeah, I believe that that particular project is actually in a lucky category that they probably, like you said, do meet that 10% of site area. Especially if that, that front parcel, I'm sorry, Christy, but where the strawberry farm is, if that is brought in and annexed like they discussed and attached, they should have really no problem meeting the 10% canopy requirement, which is new. And other than that, it's the just the change in replacement tree size, which, you know, it, it'll cost more. They're more expensive trees, but that doesn't have anything to do with the work they already put into it. Uh, let me kind of let you know a few things. Um, to, the first part of your statement was how much time and effort there was put in. There was a, a bit of a back and forth. I think we went through two revisions of the landscape plan before we felt that it was sufficient to bring to you all as a conceptual landscape plan. This image, like I said, those green lollipops are you know, the trees that were saved. And so they probably do meet what they need to. And as Mr. Richardson said, if they needed to sort of buffer that up with a little bit you know, more area, they could. Um, the lady who does this as a landscape architect uh, for this particular project, you know, again, it's just this particular project we're talking about. She's pretty good at bumping up the sizes anyways for the replacement trees. That almost is like a, a de facto thing she does because she knows what our code says right now. So again, I don't know how much change and maybe Mr. Moya will have a conversation with that landscape architect to find out dollars and cents how much that really changes it. but. You know, it can be looked at either way, that yes, they already did get, you know, their initial site plan approval from you all. They already have a development order is what we call it in our, our language. They don't have final, you know, site plan approval, which is tantamount to having almost like a development permit. So that's where the decision really, you know, could go either way. And I'm fine with it actually either way. It's, you know, it, it's, far easier if we have a starting date of today for anything new that comes in as final site plan. And like I said, if there's a way to carve out this one, so be it. And that, and that would be pretty simple. You know, you could say uh, anything that, it, uh, that already has initial site plan approval can be sort of vested in the old code. I can write it that way. Uh, I think there might be a couple commercial ones, right, that there's have initial? Few, there's a few commercial ones. Um, and how are you going to handle those? I don't want to well, open. It, it would have to be the same way. It would have to be fair across the board, I think. If you, if you say anything that has initial site plan approval is vested against the code, it would need to apply to, to all of them alike, I believe, rather than, you know, I don't think you can say we're going to give special consideration to this project because 
because Bruce happened to be in the audience, right? <laughs> are, we, are we really just talking about tree size as the only thing that's impacting Mr. The, the percentage of canopy you have to preserve, tree replacement tree size, and, numbers. and the number of trees that you quantity. have to replace, the quantity. So one of the code changes is if you remove trees of a certain size, now you have to replace more replacement trees than you did before. Well, that was these depending on the... Yeah, I wish I knew what the ask was. I, I'm not sure what the impact is on this individual. All right, anything else? No, Mayor, thank you. Mr. McDowell. Thank you, Mayor. Hey, Christy, when we were there in the room and we were going through this, it was the big issue is balancing the economics and the environment, mm -hmm. making sure that this, uh, that our standards for West Melbourne would meet or even exceed the standards of what was out there. I got the feeling that we weren't doing anything really uh, far beyond what some cities have already done. I do think that, uh, especially if we were exceeding those, then we're putting undue burden on, on the development community, and that's just wrong. I am concerned that this, uh, this is a small town, maybe 72 miles, but it does have a ripple effect. And I think that's part of what I think is happening here, is that we may have a limited, because I said, why are we doing this? We have 20% left, low, you know, but I do think it does have an impact on the community, and we've got to kind of keep that in mind, that that's what uh, our partners are dealing with out there in the field as well. Here, maybe in West Melbourne, we'll be fine. Um, I'm going to support it, but with the understanding of the uh, grandfathered in those initiatives. And then I like the clarity on the 10% because I didn't quite know what was the impact on that. But economically, for the city of West Melbourne, I support this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bachador? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, council members have been making some excellent points. and. To just to highlight how important that last 20% is for the build out and to preserve as best we can and make that 20% that real prime area that people are going to enjoy for the right reasons. I think that's incredibly important is because it's kind of like that, that, that's what the legacy will be for how seriously we take the environment in the last 20% of the city to be built out. So the points on cost, it is the developer's choice to pass those additional costs onto the consumer. They don't have to do that, right? So I find that a weak argument and one driven from greed. Um, there's always going to be the bubble boy, right? There's always going to be that one last development that's going to be on the, on the cusp of when something is enacted and when something isn't. And so I also find that, a, you know, so there's always going to be one last one. And, and whilst I understand that that might feel unfair and it might cost money, that does not mean it's not the right thing to do. Just because something costs more or is more difficult, that does not mean that it is in somehow, that, that, that it is somehow shouldn't be considered. If we're going to take the environment seriously, it is going to be more difficult and it is going to cost money. Um, so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Young. Well, thank you very much, Christy, for all the hard work that you did on this. I think it's terrific, absolutely. As we build out the last few inches that we have of left of buildable land in West Melbourne, we need to cherish every inch that we have. And I think having trees, as we've certainly heard from residents who've come in, they may not be here now, but we've heard from them. They want the trees as well. And I know that the, the uh, uh, developers that we have, they do try to save as many trees because it makes people want to buy their 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 product. Um, I'm going to support this. I don't want to be unfair. Like um, like Mr. Bentley said, if um, there's a way that we can make um, a plan that's already been approved by council, if the others, I know there's um, this particular plan is not the only one, but it, because it has that the preliminary was approved by council, they just don't have finals. I don't know where the others are, but if they're not at that point yet, um, Actually, then they're not the same. That's a really good distinction you propose. That's a that's a rational basis to separate those because only certain site plans go to council for initial approval. So, 
so that is one way. If you if you say plans, initial site plans that have been approved by council are vested against it, it would literally only be legacy. And those commercial site plans, they don't go to council for approval. So they simply wouldn't be vested if that's the rule you want to adopt. So that is one way to distinguish if, if you're looking for a way to distinguish between those others out there and, and the legacy one you just heard about in, in particular. Can we do that? Is that yes. possible to do that? Um, then I, I'm going to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as we all know that one of the biggest complaints we get is, I can't believe they knocked down all the trees. And of course, the, of course the developers say, the trees won't live, we gotta put in a lot of fill. Well, with a lot of work and ingenuity, they can save more trees and, and they do look at the springs of hibiscus and our real first test, I think they did an excellent job in saving as many trees as they could. Some of it because uh, it cost them money, but I think mostly because of the beauty of that development. And even back then, that development sold right out because of the beauty. Uh, we could make this tougher and bring in that one speaker that uh, Mr. Dittmore is talking about and put her on the committee instead of some landscape architects or, or uh, you can get some of your friends up in Titusville and drag this out for three years. I think this is just a good, happy medium that we were proposing. So, Mr. Dittmore. Oh, thank you, Mayor. I just, uh, I'm trying to dissect this. The, so the first 80% of the build out, we have not been environmentally responsible. I mean, I, I think we have been. I don't think it's bad. and. And all these complaints, I've never received one complaint about the tree situation. And I would encourage the Home Builders Association to do a public records request of all counsel for all emails and text messages for people complaining about these this tree issue, if it does exist. Um, I would challenge that. I mean, we may have got some phone calls from some people, but I've never received one call, one message from anyone in the four years that I've been here about the trees. I think the city has done an amazing job on this as far as doing this in the last few years. So I'm really not quite sure why we're here if we're, if we're to believe the first 80% of the build-out we weren't environmentally conscious. I think we have been, and I don't think that there would be a big difference in the last 20%. I think it looks amazing for what they've done. I'm not against all of this, but I am concerned about the, the grandfathering section. So if we have an amendment to the grandfathering section and whatever we're going to move forward, but as it stands, as the motion is right now, I won't support it. But I would, I would challenge the fact that I would like to, to see some of these, these complaints, all these emails and phone calls, text messages, whatever. I'd like to see some of that because I've never seen any of it. I mean, I just haven't. Staff has. Just well, if you have, that's great. Bring it forward so we could see it. You know, the, I mean, there's 28,000 people living in this community. Right. Show me 1%, 280. I'd, I'd deal with that. I haven't I seen anything. Be that, but you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We've had more than just the one person. <laughs> all right. Uh, Mr. Francis, are you still there? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm okay with you not supporting this, Mr. Moore. <laughs> um, and that's fine. Um, I think we have talked on this council over and over again that we're okay with leading the way. And I believe Mr. McDowell was one of the ones that promotes that all the time. You know, let's lead the way. And I think, I think this gets us to, you know, if, if we're not the most strict of the communities, then that's fine. I, I'm okay. I like the plan for West Melbourne. I don't care what the other cities do. This is a good plan for us. I'm not worried about a ripple effect. It, it works for us. So... I'm not going to change the motion. If you guys don't like the motion, don't vote for it. Thank you. That's always good, solid advice. All right. <laughs> so we have a motion and a second to pass the ordinance as presented. Uh, does uh, staff need any direction? No, I'm just going to point out that the motion as made, it only provides for vesting for those plans uh, where the final site plan has already been, uh, the application's already been submitted. 
so it didn't include any change for the discussion that came later about trying to vest projects where council had approved the initial site plan. That's all. Just. All right. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, take a vote saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion carries six to one with Dittmore voting nay. All right. Next up, we have public hearing, comprehensive plan amendment, rezoning and development agreement for Polte Homes. And they want to postpone this to the June 21st, 2022 uh, meeting. That's correct, so we just need a motion. And just for clarification, it's staff that's insisting that this be postponed because the development agreement was not ripe, it was not ready to come to you all. We'd have too much endless chatter about it, it needs to be fixed. Okay, can we have a motion, please? Deputy Mayor Young. I'll make the motion, please, to um, postpone the Pulte Homes item. Thank you, Mr. Bachador. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. That brings us to the public forum where speakers have three minutes to address City Council. Eric, do we have any speaker cards? Yes. Thank you. Tony Vazon. Tony. Good evening. Good Tony evening. Vazone, um, 4275 Alyssa Lane, West Melbourne. Um, last uh, council meeting, I had an item before you that um, was requesting a zoning change, obviously, that um, changed the zoning to a zoning category that was discussed among council as perhaps being a spot zoning. And there was some further discussion about maybe the use that we were looking to use there, which was indoor climate controlled storage, perhaps might uh, be considered as a conditional use being added to the C1 zoning as a more of a compatible type option. And maybe even perhaps adding as the conditional use, some of the items that we spoke of as um, conditions that we had in the um, development agreement, you know, as far as landscaping and architecturals and stuff. And, and I just wanted to propose that council perhaps discuss this and maybe propose to staff that they look into adding the indoor climate controlled storage under certain conditions as a conditional use option under the C1 zoning. Mr. Dittmore. Thank you, Mayor. I was gonna bring this up in the council reports. Uh, we talked about this at the last meeting about um, perhaps changing uh, some of this, uh, the way that those are set up because they're not the typical storage units and uh, how they might fit more of a commercial in the commercial zoning rather than the uh, industrial, is that right? Industrial, yeah. So I, you know, if it's, and I talked to staff about this um, last week and they said they really didn't get any direction from us. I know we just kind of discussed it, kind of, but I wasn't really sure and, and, I, and I would uh, ask that we um, support having staff taking a look at this and bring some option to us, options to us uh, to consider something like this for uh, commercial zoning. I think you'd have to make it a uh, agenda item. We don't think we can all just uh, figure out what we want to do. And well, as far as, I mean, it's, I was going to do the council report, so usually we just kind of give direction to staff. So I, does anybody object to that, to have them bring some option to us, some ideas? You're wanting to change what's allowed in the institutional zoning? No, in the commercial. Oh, in the commercial. In the commercial, I'm sorry. Yeah, in the commercial. Make it institutional. In that specific zoning district, the C1. So we, we've got like four different commercial and. What was your thought on that? I don't know if you talked to Christy. No, not well, a little bit, yeah, but just, yeah. I'm not really a fan of that, but it's, right. you know, we take council direction. So Thank you. Mr. Morgan tells us. So I'm not in favor of it. You know, it's it probably for doesn't support it. Once you talk to staff more and, a little better uh, understanding. 
Yep. Yeah. All right. Any other speaker cards? Seeing none, we'll close the public forum. Bring us the consent agenda. We need a motion to pass the regular city council meeting that we had Tuesday, May 3rd. Mr. Frampus. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll make a motion that we accept the consent agenda as it's written. Deputy Mayor Young. Second. All those in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. That brings us to our action item. Our first item is final plat of the Space Coast Town Center East, Phase 1A. Okay. Um, this is an item that also went to your advisory board, the Planning and Zoning Board. Um, the name of the, uh, the development that folks see sort of south of uh, the, uh, the Birds Western where is called Space Coast Town Center. And so final plat has to do with subdividing. Um, they're calling this phase 1A. So the background of this is that the property owner is the organization called Space Coast Town Center. And we talked briefly about the location, but this aerial shows you a little bit more of the location, it shows you the roads, highway, you know, US 192 and St. John's Heritage Parkway to the west of of some of this project area, and then you have I-95 all the way to the east. Um, the area in the yellow polygon and sort of that yellow outline is 23.76 acres, and part of that area is part of an existing subdivision called Space Coast Center East Phase 1. Um, that particular subdivision created one lot and five tracks of more than 100 acres. The applicant's request is for a final plat for phase 1A to take one of those tracks that had already been split up and divide that further into a few other, uh, one lot and three tracks. Um, any subdivision approval is a two-part process with a recommendation, like I said, from PNC stands for Planning and Zoning Board that occurred May 10th and then as a governing body from City Council. So the, the tracked information, if you looked on the left-hand left, left -hand side of the screen, we're kind of pointing to, you know, tract E with that orange arrow becoming lot two and then also becoming, if you look at the little table we have here, you know, tract A1, tract G, tract H, and then you have um, the tract C also. Uh, so you have a few tracks that are developed. Um, lot two would be sold to a private developer uh, right now. It's currently the master developer. That's Space Coast Town Center that owns it, but it would get sold off to a separate developer, and that's part of it. Christy, I have a question for you real quick. Sure. Um, it looks like the county pond I, I was is cut in half, and, and that's getting included in all this yeah. before it's rezoned? Um, let me get to where that is again here. Yeah, from this image... Um, you can see that, yes, indeed, um, this county pond does not have a city zoning, does not have a city's comprehensive plan. It has county designation. Um, the developer was going to submit everything to us at once to make it so that that pond, you know, does have the zoning and future land use. They can tell you more about that delay. I think it had to do with some of the discussions with the county, why it wasn't brought forward, you know, sooner with this replat. Um, so the replat is only of the property that they have on their land and technically, you know, changing and including in the subdivision this little bit of the county property, um, that, that's just part of the plat process. So the city attorney and I have talked a little bit about that, um, but, you know, we, we can discuss that. I was going to go through the rest of the presentation and let you know from the comprehensive plan and from the land development regulations that most of the plat, you know, what as they have presented it, does meet our code, does meet the comprehensive plan. Um, and then the reason why we have a condition of approval that the final mylar, so if this is approved tonight with the conditions, with one of them being that they have to finish what they need to with this county pond area in terms of the future lane use and the zoning and the amendment to the master plan, um, then that would be what would trigger them being able to finally, you know, sign the Mylar, have the mayor sign it, and then take it up to be recorded. Okay, I guess I'll save my questions for the end of your, okay. your presentation. Thank you. 
um, this is a bigger perspective, you know, of what you see in, in terms of the images that were attached to the staff report of the actual replat. And you can see lot two, you know, that would be the, the 20.86 20, 20 acres and the re remaining tracks, you know, comprise uh, almost the three acres. Um, there would be the private road that would be a continuation you know, of that, that notion from the master plan of having a road that, you know, connects to St. John's Heritage Parkway and leads through the rest of the development. It is consistent that the part that is a lot too that's already, you know, in the city in terms of its future land use and zoning, um, that is consistent with um, some of the other documents. But I, I did again want to reiterate that the plat would not be recorded until the county pond relocation related future land use and zoning are signed as well as included in the master concept plan. Um, you know, properties like this lot two could not be sold until that final plat is not just approved but also recorded. They, they did submit an initial sort of construction drawing for this project and some of that does meet, you know, what we need. Um, another condition is that third bullet related to transportation. This would apply for any of the replats that come in and any of the projects that would come, you know, to the city submitted to city staff or, or, you know, submitted as part of the public hearing process. The developer has to submit something called a trip vesting reporting form. So they did that with the Integra Apartments. And what that, that does is it helps us keep track of that drawdown of the 3,800 trips that are vested. So those are PM peak hour trips that are vested as a result of the discussions that, you know, Mr. Farrell did with the county and getting the St. John's Heritage Parkway um, to be the way it is and his donation of land. Um, so they're aware of that. You know, we've talked about that before and I believe the developer and the potential developer are here in the audience. Um, there's some other agency permits that they'll have to get and they'll have to show us that, you know, they have a final set of construction drawings and how they're gonna build that infrastructure. Um, so the recommendation, you know, from staff, if you do want to move forward, and that's entirely, you know, dependent on the conversation we have after this item is, is presented, you know, the developer, regardless of what would, hap would happen, would have to post the performance bond if they want to move forward and have the, the mylar recorded. Let's say there were no other conditions, that would absolutely always be a condition. You know, or they would have to build the subdivision improvements. So they've indicated to us that they would probably post the performance bond like they did with the, the phase one. Um, that's the same thing that they did. Uh, number two is also required, and they did that with phase one too. They submitted a trip vesting report, so that's still an applicable condition. And number three is that condition we just talked about, that you know, until you all approve that county pond relocation and the related documents, meaning the comprehensive plan amendments, because there's two things that will come to you on that, the rezoning and the development agreement revision, um, that would have to occur prior to recordation of that flat mylar. So does that make sense to you all, more or less? What doesn't make sense is why they're doing this at all now when they can't even record it. Feels like we're putting a cart before the horse here. Continue. Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, at this point, you may want to ask, like I said, there was in you know, a discussion back in January about all of it moving forward together. Um, what got submitted to staff was, you know, this replat, um, separate and independent from the other documents. We did get the other documents about two and a half weeks ago. Um, so they weren't submitted at the same time. I mean, after all this, they're going to still have to submit a new master plan, right? As part of the development agreement. Yeah, part yes. of the development agreement. Yes. So, uh, yeah, they, they would just need to revise that document. So, remember the development agreement has the master plan as an exhibit. So, that's how they're changing the master plan is by changing the development agreement, you know, including a new drawing that shows the revised master plan. Does that change the comp plan as well? Yes, they do. And that's why I said there's actually two comp plan amendments. So one is a text amendment, and the other would be a, a map amendment to show, you know, that it's no longer, I think the county has it is zoned as community commercial with a, well, it has a future lane use community commercial and the zoning as TU1. So it would no longer be county designation, it would be city. And just to 
question. I guess I didn't catch where it was going. They're going to actually fill in this pond for land, correct? I believe so, but I think at this point would be a good time to get the developer up here to answer some of those. I didn't things. want to interrupt your beautiful presentation. <laughs> but also, that, where is the new holding tank for the water going to be? I mean, is there another uh, pond that they're digging up? Yes, they, they would have some additional pond area. Okay. Mr. Richardson? I, I just wanted to say that, yes, this is very much out of sequence and what you would normally expect to see. Typically, with the approvals they're requesting, you would see them all coming in. We would process them concurrently, typically. The dilemma that staff is in somewhat is that because Mr. Moy has submitted the, the replat application, when he did, by statute, we're on a shot clock. We have to consider it and either approve or deny it within a certain amount of time. And if we miss that window, then it's considered automatically approved. So what could happen is that council could approve this tonight and it's just not recorded until the other things take place. Council could deny it. Uh, the applicant could withdraw it and ask that it be considered when those other things come forward. The one thing that council can't do is say we're going to postpone this indefinitely until the other things come forward. We're just not going to consider it because we don't think it's right. Because if you do that, the effect of that will be that it's automatically approved as submitted sometime in July, I think the expiration of the time period is. It is. It was submitted January 18th, expiration of the 180-day shot clock by Florida statute, July so, 17th. So that's why staff is bringing it forward at this time when you know, it certainly would be our preference that these are all considered together because some of the questions you're asking, Mayor, would be apparent. It would it would make a lot more sense if you had the master plan in front of you and you could see what's going to happen with that pond and things like that. That's it. Uh, are you, anything else or you want to bring to the developer? No, I, I just want to reiterate what Mr. Richardson said, and it's just sort of my own personal side, you know, how we all in government understand that every year there's more and more home rule taken away and more things imposed on us from the statutes. That shot clock one is an, a heinous one. It's an awful one for local governments. So you may end up hearing more about that in the future. Mm. Does the developer want to address city council? Coast Town Center, 7485 Fairway Drive, Miami Lakes, Florida, 33014. Um, I'm here to answer any questions. Oh, one thing you need to know is um, that uh, we started sometime in August acquiring the, yeah, I think it was actually July, acquiring the county pond from the county. Uh, we were supposed to go forward in September. Um, amazingly, we, although we met every requirement, we received final approval in uh, March, it was, or February or March from the county. Uh, the county was supposed to call, uh, close, uh, I think, March 23rd uh, by an agreement we had with them. They closed a month later. We had everything, you know, submitted and all that stuff. Uh, the issue, uh, we didn't want to fall behind and, you know, it takes a while to get a plat. So Bruce submitted the plat. Uh, we would have been here September. We would have been here six months ago, uh, or not six months ago, but several months ago, um, if the county had moved more quickly. But they said that, um, you know, this wasn't a big deal to them and they had a lot of important business. So we felt, you know, we keep missing. It, unfortunately, deadline after deadline was passed. So, so we're here today. Um, however, you guys want to handle it. I mean, we we're actually not going to report cord the plant until we get ready to sell the property because we have no interest in creating a parcel like that unless we're going to sell that parcel. So, um, if you guys want, excuse me, if you honor gentlemen want to and ladies want to wait till later, that's absolutely fine with us. It's, it's no problem. We weren't going to record it until um, the transaction was complete, any, well, ready to be completed anyway. Um, the way it works, uh, 
Okay, so uh, you have a laser pointer, or okay, um, if he'd speak into that mic, a ridge, the pond in the middle of the property, uh, which is kind of embraced by that yellow amoeba at the bottom, that pond right there was always sized to take the county drainage because in the original deal with um, Tuck uh, Farrell, uh, whom who you, people might, some of you might know Tuck. Um, the idea was uh, that the plan we had uh, in our agreement with Tuck, and I think if you even look at the master plan that was originally approved, uh, you'll notice the county pond was gone, and there was a um, there there was a parcel there to sell, or there was intended to have a parcel there for sale. So, so we had always planned to move the county pond. And we had discussions before we closed on the property with the county. So we'd always intend to move the drainage that's in the county pond into the central um, area, and it was fine with the county. It just happened to take a long time because it wasn't a high priority for them. Um, so we have uh, drawings which have been approved by the county and by your staff, I believe, to infrastructure improvements to move the drainage which would be caught uh, near where the county pond is now from St. John's Heritage Parkway. That county pond is for the St. John's Heritage Parkway drainage in that area. And then uh, pipe it over to the, uh, to the central pond. Uh, we cannot fill the pond, of course, until we complete those improvements. And so when those improvements are completed, the, the, the connection uh, that would divert the drainage into our pond uh, then we can, with county approval, fill the county pond. We now own the county pond, um, so we're, we're in a position to, uh, you know, make representations concerning that property. Are there any other questions? I, I have a question. Uh, how much of your, this change is determined by you guys trying to divert the road through taking down that tree line there that the residents there were so adamant about not losing. Absolutely nothing. Uh, because that says nothing to do with Because that. if we put the roadway in there and divert the traffic through off of uh, Brandywine on to Heritage and do away with the 192 uh, access point, am, am I off track here, Sin? Yes, that's not part of this proposal. Because it looks like, I know, but it looked like that's where we were actually going to put the cut through. No. This, so this private road isn't going to be the diversion there no, you were not talking about before? No, it's not No, this, this private road would hook back up to the Integra Apartments. That's all that it would hook back up to. But it still looks like it would divert, it would take it take it. down that tree line, right? Um, the, the one along the canal, it they may have to remove some of that. Some of it is going to be in the canal right of way. Let me get back to that image here with the aerial. So, yes, you're, you're correct. But remember, the property appraiser lines are not accurate. So I'm not sure exactly where in the tree line. But I remember this discussion coming up and, and uh, the developer commenting on how they weren't going to remove the whole tree line, but now it but looks like. But in the master plan, we always did have a road shown along that south area. So that's not a change. That's not something different. I mean, the, the residents may have talked about that, but it's always been that development agreement. Yeah, there's, there's been a road to the south from the beginning. It's, it, this really is just following in on acquiring the county pond and um, converting it into developable property and putting the drainage into our master pond like we had uh, discussed before we even closed on the property. And I think it's consistent with the original, uh, everything we said in the original development agreement. And I don't believe we changed any of the roads. Mr. Mr. Bachelor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. For me, the, the issue is not about the pond. For, for me, the issue is we were presented with this glorious master plan several years ago about a luxury walkable community with all of this wonderful features that was going to be the jewel of West Melbourne. And now you're coming to us saying, oh, actually, we're going to sell it to somebody who's going to build more apartments next to a bunch of apartments next to a bunch of apartments. Here. 
there, there's a one apartment complex here. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's not that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making. Is single family rental community. The documents in front of me are saying something different. They're saying multifamily, which is apartments. Um, these are single family homes. Would you address that, please, Vicky? A rental community we look at as an apartment complex. We don't look at it as being just single family. I know that's the product and the wording they use for marketing, but that's not the way staff looks at it or yep. processes it. I thought I understood that correctly, yeah. yeah and this is still the same designation that has always been for that apartment. Well, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't the case, was it? Because you came before this council and convinced the council to actually change the ratio of multifamily versus commercial versus, you remember? I certainly remember it, because, you know, I was definitely not a fan, as I'm sure you remember. Uh, yes, I remember. Yeah, yeah. So but by um, this replatting, we're going to end up with there's yet, no, yet... no replat or rechange of use. This is the same use that was always targeted for this particular property. Well, that's not what you presented to this council, because what you presented to this council, so what you just stated. Right here, if you look at the master plan, you can bring up the master plan. It's always been. I don't have the master plan. It's just the final plat that we have here on the screen. Yeah, that's always been planned for multifamily. It's no change whatsoever. But it was it was your company's intention to do that development. So, but now you're saying that you. Always our intention to sell off properties, always. Never said anything different. Well, I will agree to disagree. But the impression that you left me, and I suspect some of my colleagues up here, is very different from the statements that you have just been made. That you have just made. We, we sell off properties. Some we develop. Some we sell. Yeah. Okay. All right. Christy, does this development, I know we're not really talking about the development per se now, but will that inc uh, be incorporated in the ratios of, I think it's for 60% apartments? Yes. Yeah, they're not going to be able to go beyond that unless they do, you know, some comprehensive plan text amendment to those ratios. But, yeah, they're, they're locked into those ratios. So speaking of that, as their footprint, did it, is it over 200 acres now, or will it be? Um, <laughs> that's a complicated question because the Fulcher property and its development agreement isn't executed yet. So technically with the four, 4.5 acres, I think, of County Pond, they won't be. They'll still be under the 200 acres. But I thought they were at 180, the, 198 acres and I thought the pond would put them over because I specifically asked that question before, and the pond would put you over you, the 200 acres. Yes, you're correct, except that that development agreement that council approved last year that brought it up to the to the brink to I believe 199 point something acres or something. was Fulcher uh, property. That was adding the Fulcher property in, but that was contingent on the mortgage holder executing a joinder, which to date hasn't been done. That development agreement hasn't been recorded. They Fulcher park property as we stand here today is not part of not formally part of Space Coast Town Center. It's approved when every contingency occurs, uh, but it's not presently. Ultimately, this will go over 200. The comprehensive plan amendments that are being discussed to change the comp plan and, and zoning of the pond also include whatever is necessary text amendments to the comp plan potentially if this does go over 200. So they would have to meet all that criteria prior to recording this plat and being able to sell it off. But um, so if the Fulcher property pushes it over 200, then it has the potential of not being approved, correct? Right. I, they, they can't go over 200 uh, without a change to the comprehensive plan, a text amendment to the right. comp plan. That's correct. So that's why I said it was complicated. All right. Any other questions? Any other from you? Glad to answer any questions. Thank you. So I want to see if I'm clear on this. 
the developer said we can pass it or not pass it. Is that what I heard? Yeah. Um, this is Okay. We wouldn't create the parcel until we were ready to do something. Okay, so it would take them withdrawing it formally, as Mr. Richardson said. They, we can't just postpone because okay. of the shot clock, you know, information that we have under Florida statutes. Well, we don't. No, he said we can't deny it. So I guess the question is, we can he pass it, or you could. He can. I thought he said we could deny it. You could. Well, you, you, you could deny it if you felt it wasn't ripe. I mean, frankly, you could deny it as inconsistent with the comprehensive plan right now, which it is because you already know you're going to have to change the comprehensive plan. I did have a good discussion uh, with, with the attorney for Town Center who handles the development agreement. And with the conditions that are on this plat, if you were to approve, and, and I misspoke earlier, I said you can approve, you can deny, you just can't do nothing. I should have said you can approve with conditions or deny, you just can't do nothing. If you approve it with the conditions requested by staff, that will ensure that either at the time of recordation that it is in compliance with everything required or that it simply vanishes. Because, for example, if, if when everything else comes to you, if Fulcher's incorporated, and this is all over 200, if you were to not approve those text amendments, for example, this would disappear because a condition of it is all of those comprehensive plans, zoning, other actions also taking place. So it's sort of a matter of sequence at this point. Mr. Francis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I don't I don't like the whole idea of doing these things out of order. I don't think it I think there's a lot of moving parts here. I'm gonna make a motion that we deny this and they can resubmit it at a later date. Okay, we have a motion for denial. Do we have a second? Mr. Bachelor? Second. Bachelor seconded it. I know that some, we don't some, have, I'm sorry, Bruce Moy with that. Not a public hearing. We're the engineer of record for the I'm sorry, we, project. Can you, okay, there we go, how's that? Um, just want to make sure, because I know in some instances if something gets denied, you can't bring it back for a certain amount of time. Is that an issue? Because if that's an issue, then we need to withdraw this, because if we can't come back for six months because we got denied. Morris, I'm not aware of that for this. Uh, I, that's the case for a rezoning. I don't believe that's the uh, the case for a plat approval. I'm pretty confident it's not, but I, I think you'd be better served probably to withdraw it, but um, and then bring it forward with everything else. We'll, we'll formally request to withdraw it then for the time being. I'm sorry, would you say that again? So we would request to formally withdraw our, our this item for now. Okay. And we'll bring it back when we're ready with all the parts to it. Yeah, the, the thing got out of sequence because of the county delays. Yeah. We're, we're glad to get it back in sequence and do whatever it takes to make it a more presentable and digestible whole. I think that's what you kind of said very at the beginning and then we kind of got waylaid there. Well, I'd yeah. like to see the Fulcher property thing resolve itself too. It seems like that's a, a being delayed or mismanaged or something. It well, just... I, I really, I don't think it's mismanaged as much as the Tuck uh, Farrell who has the mortgage on the property views that property as competition to his security, even though we've offered it as additional security. So we're having trouble, uh, you know, understanding Tuck's rationale, but, um, you know, he owns the mortgage and that's what he gets to do. Yeah, they're, they're not playing nice in the sandbox for sure. Uh, okay. No, there's, uh, so now if we... If it's withdrawn, you have no action to consider. All right. Well, hopefully we all learn a little on that one. Okay, so our next uh, item then is item 10B, resolution supporting Vision Zero. Deputy Mayor Young. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if you look at the resolution, this is for Vision Zero. We have TPO staff here with a presentation. 
And uh, I know I've, I've mentioned uh, Vision Zero in my council reports several times. Um, this is a, a movement towards zero traffic fatalities, tra zero um, serious traffic accidents. Kim is going to tell you more about that. On the resolution, if you turn to the back page under section two, that's kind of the meat of it right there. City Council hereby supports and will provide city staff to participate in countywide or multi-jurisdictional Vision Zero Safety Committees comprised of members, organizations, and agencies with expertise in transportation. You can read the rest of it yourself. From what I've seen of other other cities, it's really the, the TPO that has the staff that does this. I haven't really seen a lot of cities. I haven't seen a burden placed on cities to, to um, take the resolution. Yeah, and we, we actually had a, um, and I'll get into it a little bit in the presentation, but we, we kind of had a change based on feedback from other cities that asking them to do an action plan and, and all of that was cumbersome. So um, basically the ask tonight is um, to adopt the goal of zero serious injury or, or traffic fatalities. And then um, a city staff member to our leadership, um, Vision Zero leadership team, which is um, could be law enforcement, it could be planning person, it could be basically be anybody. But those that are adopting Vision Zero, that's what we're, and that committee only meets once every three months, so it's not a, for a couple hours, so it's not a huge time. So anyhow, my name is Kim Smith. <laughs> I am the Education and Safety Coordinator with um, the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization. I am also the Project Manager for the, the Vision Zero project, and thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. Um, one thing about Vision Zero, we hear click it or ticket, drive sober, get pulled over, all those fancy little catch lines that we have with traffic safety. Vision Zero is not that, not that. It's not a tagline. This is truly a different way of looking about how we plan, educate, and go about um, designing our roadways. For a long time, we've kind of said, oh, well, yeah, you know, we're going to get a few people killed. It's the price of, uh, price of doing business on our roadways. And we're learning that's not the, count, the, the case. Um, everybody has a right to get where they're going, whether you're walking, biking, riding a motorcycle, everybody has a right to get where they're going safely. And this is a, this is a strategy to eliminate serious injury and fatal crashes. Just to clarify that, because as soon as you say you're going to eliminate serious injury and fatal crashes, people hear you're gonna eliminate crashes. Well. That would be nice, but really what we want to do is eliminate those crashes that are um, serious enough that they're incapacitating to people or they're, you know, they are dying in these crashes. And we know that 94% of those crashes are human error um, on one road, road user or the other. So there is a path to preventing those type of crashes. Not an easy one, but um, it can be done. All right, so just a quick look at some of the um, crash data here in Brevard County. You can see 2021 that is consistent actually with um, national, kind of national stats that jump in fatalities. And if you look at, um, or the total crashes, uh, that was an unintended consequence of, of COVID. The roads cleared out, everybody had free shot going everywhere they went, they were going like crazy. And as we return to no normal, people still want to drive like crazy. And um, you can see on the bottom there some of the, some of the, the types of crashes that, that are made up in those numbers. Um, distracted driving, just to let you know that's not necessarily a phone, that's everything that anybody's doing behind the wheel that's taking their attention away from, from driving. The other thing that I do want to point out, um, back up in the top chart, if you look at 2021, we were up 1.8% in um, fatalities, serious injuries and fatalities um, over the year before. What we saw, because we did drop a little in serious injuries and they did nationwide too, but what happened is those became fatalities because of the high speeds. So it really wasn't a good a good thing. So, uh, looking a little bit more close to home for, for you, uh, West Melbourne, um, this is what you had last year and what you've had over the last five years. Um, I'm not even going to jinx it when I pulled this and I saw those 
three zeros at the bottom, I was like, wow, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say because you won't find that in, in very many cities in, in Brevard County for sure. So, um, and I actually do know that we've had at least one pedestrian fatality in the city of West Melbourne already in 2022. So, um, here, here are more local stats. Um, on this chart over here is your high injury network. Um, you, you have it right in front of you, so I know that legend is really small, so you can kind of see what those colors of those lines mean. And this is last year's, and I don't have a choice on those dots. I know they're really light and hard to see. That comes out of the state database, so that's why the red ones are fatalities, which a couple of those you can see are out on the interstate, which doesn't come within the jurisdiction of West Melbourne, but they get coded as West Melbourne. And then um, the smattering of the other dots that are on there. Just want to play a video that kind of, um, and it's very short, but it kind of grabs the whole idea of how, how people think about fatalities and crashes on our road. I think is a more acceptable number. No. No. Did you know in Florida, an average of 800 pedestrians and bicyclists are fatally injured in traffic crashes every year? What do you think is a more acceptable number? Acceptable? Um, maybe 50? Okay, this is what 50 people look like. Well, that's my family, my friends. So now, what do you think is a more acceptable number? Zero. Definitely zero. So I think what that video shows is, is this about a change of perception? Um, nobody wants to be the one even, you know, obviously we don't want it to be in our family. I personally don't want it to be anybody because this is what I do. but. You know, which one, which one of us would want to step up and, oh, yeah, you know, we could lose 25 people a year and I want to be the one to pick them. Um, we don't want to do that. So this is a cultural shift and a different way about, about how we look at traffic safety. How do we get there? Um, we use this, it's, it's about safe systems. It's about designing a system, not putting a traffic light here, taking the whole corridor, looking at it, and how do we make it better? Um, it involves safe roads. That involves proven countermeasures. Speed management plays a big role in this. There is absolutely no question that speed is one of the largest contributors to the severity of a crash. Safe road users, um, TPO, we're very involved in outreach and education, and that's what that's about, um, teaching folks how to use the system, how to use new countermeasures that are put in. Safe vehicles is going to be a big part of this. Um, they're designing. They're designing vehicles that can do more and more um, and help prevent crashes. Um, and then post-crash care. We did a, a safe system symposium and heard from a trauma doctor who said that first hour is just critical in whether somebody lives or dies after a crash. And is that they've, they've been out, he used to ride the helicopter, he said, go out to I-95 and trying to land and can't even land because for some reason there's still cars going by. And so, you know, you've got to, got to work with EMS and make sure they can get to the scene. Um, just real quickly, where, where Vision Zero started and, and where we are with it here in Brevard County, the TPO adopted our Vision Zero resolution in July of 2019. Um, a year later, we adopted our action plan in October, we revealed a web-based toolkit. Um, it is housed on our website if you want to take a look at it, but it basically gives resolutions and all these different tools for people to, to use when doing roadway planning. And then in May of last year, we had our first Vision Zero leadership team meeting. And then actually just last week, we had our first Vision Zero leadership team meeting that has the new focus where we're including all of the cities that have adopted Vision Zero and it's going to kind of be joint. We're all working, as Georgiana likes to say, our executive director, we're all pulling in the same direction because we, we need all of our community partners to, to be on board with this. Um, to date, here are the seven, hopefully tonight will be eight cities that have adopted this. I'm, I'm working my way around. I'm retiring in the end of the year and hoping I can get most of these out of the way before then. Um, but these are the cities that have adopted to date. I would also say that uh, Florida Department of Transportation and the um, U.S. Highway Administration, I didn't get their name right, um, 
both have zero goals. So the federal government and our state government both have zero goals as well. Um, we talked a little bit about the leadership committee. Um, so how can you help even, even if, you, if you chose not to adopt the resolution tonight? It's all about you know, supporting proven countermeasures, and I know roundabouts a, a, a dirty word and things like that, but roundabouts, enhanced mid-block crosswalks, all of those things, as you were talking about trees, I was thinking they play a role in traffic safety too. If they're closer to the roadway, they create an effect that can slow people down. Um, and as, as just a person, a family member, talk to people about, talk to your loved ones about traffic safety. Start that conversation at home. And the bottom line is if we want to change what's going on on our roadways, we have to change. We need, dra you know, I don't want to say drastic change because some of this stuff that, that we're doing and the way that FDOT is looking at things, and they started immediately. They, they created a safety office a year ago, and they've already changed 90 projects in District 5 that we're getting ready to go out that they've added safety features to. So they're extremely serious about this too. And of course, what they do benefits all of us in Brevard County because we have so many state roads. So thank you. And we, as the TPO, we would certainly be Really excited to have you adopt this resolution um, on, on behalf of myself and Georgiana and Gillette and the whole TPO and FDOT. They are just amazed with what Brevard County is doing. So they would all certainly th throw their support behind this. Yes, Mr. Bachador. Thank you for that presentation, Ms. Smith. Um, I think we all understand that it's an aspirational target rather than an absolute target and we're sensitive to the, the risks versus the freedoms that people still want to enjoy, of course. I'm wondering if you actually have some additional data to share on the statistics that you presented that adjusts for, um, as, as you know, the COVID years are an outlier, but over a five-year period, there's been an increase in density of traffic naturally, and so the number of cars per mile on the road in 2022 is not necessarily comparable with 2017. Um, so have, have those data been adjusted for that? And also, is there a, a demographic breakdown? Is there a particular demographic that is more susceptible to the serious injury and fatality um, where you can more clearly target your messaging? In, in, in some communities, there, there definitely are those areas, different demographics. I know here in Brevard County, um, our biggest problem is probably pedestrians. Um, they represent, so pedestrians represent less than 2% of all of our crashes, but, and this is average over a five-year period, some of the data you were asking for, they represent 36% of our fatalities, being less than 2% of, of all crashes. Um, and then when you include bicycles and motorcycles in there, I, I ran just for this year, those three modes, those are considered vulnerable road users, um, uh, three or four weeks ago, and, and they were representing at that point 73% um, of our, of our traffic fatalities to date, year to date in 2022. Um, back to what you said as far as five year, we have seen an increase um, with crashes, but yes, volumes do. Um, what they see though is, while I don't have specific data, what we see is those fatalities are, are going up at a more alarming rate, like traffic crashes are actually going down. There was a, um, a county commission meeting where they were talking about traffic safety and one commissioner was saying traffic crashes are down and the other one was arguing it with fatalities are up. And I'm like, they're both right. Because yes, traffic crashes are down as a whole, but the fatalities are up. Last year it was 18%. Um, and that's not, you know, not just, co I mean, it started to grow. And any, thank you. Any shareable data on particular at-risk demographics? Um, here in Brevard County, we really work kind of all over the place. It's hard to develop a pattern that makes it part, you know, so we just, we try to saturate with education. We do reach out to um, some untraditional type partners, churches that have food banks. Um, we've, uh, we've put pedestrian safety messaging out through homeless coalitions, just trying to, to you know, 
get messaging everywhere we can to try to okay so the so you you you're mentioning a particular demographic of a walker biker to, in that in that particular case yeah well, because okay, okay i understand that because that yeah 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 and if you ever want to confuse anybody just put a number on something <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. well this is commendable work and so i make the motion to adopt resolution number 2022-11 uh, supporting the vision of zero traffic fatalities and serious injuries thank you mr May. thank you mr mcdowell I'll second that, but I do have questions. All right, go ahead. Uh, what I would like to know, thank you for your presentation. The eight that have already embraced and adopted, what was the timing on that? Have we, I mean, have you seen success already in those areas? How are you monitoring this? It's, it's kind of really too early to, okay. to, to measure success. Um, so what we do see is that we see that our fatalities, if you want to look at something that's that's kind of consistent, they happen on roadways over four lanes with speeds higher than 35 miles an hour, which uh, it, you know is is a lot of our state roads. US one is a which I feel very fortunate doesn't run through your community is a is a terrible corridor for for traffic crashes, very serious traffic crashes of all users you know, uh, cars as well as, as bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, so a lot of this is gonna come back to FDOT, but they're moving very quickly. I would expect in a year, things are gonna look look very different than what they do now. All right, and just a uh, quick follow up on that, is that the execution of that? Because I do believe, and I don't wanna make light of it, but you know, my daughter in college, you know, I don't want, I want zero tolerance on overdrafts, but if I don't have a plan, she's gonna overdraft or he's gonna overdraft. So what are you going to, or do we actually have an executable plan? Do we own the plan? Is that our responsibility then? The, the TPO has a plan. Um, it was written originally for the TPO uh, with the idea that it would be rewritten in three to five years and we're actually coming up on that first. You know, we knew that the plan that we wrote wouldn't get us to zero. Um, so you kind of put the low hanging fruit and you can say, okay, we've accomplished this. Uh, so we'll be looking fairly quickly to rewrite that. Um, the leadership team, I think, gives a great opportunity for the cities to kind of talk about what they're doing, what's working, that, that kind of thing moving forward. And FDOT sits in on that as well. But the second, the, our next plan definitely will have more of that, what we're gonna be hearing from our local municipalities. Of course, each municipality is gonna have to talk amongst themselves, so to right. speak, about what, what they're going to do to, to get to this goal. But I think that they'll be hearing some, some great ideas around the table and, and this leadership team. We do have a secret weapon and that is our deputy mayor though. So I think yeah. he'll help us. <laughs> yeah, she Thank gets, you she so gets much. to hear it all. <laughs> Mr. Francis. Thank you, Ms. Smith, for your presentation. And um, I worked rescue for 12 years and I know until you change, you know, I've seen many deaths over that period of time. And until you change the actual mentality of the drivers, the mentality of the pedestrians, and the mentality of the bicyclers using crosswalks, you know, not taking that shortcut across, you know, in the middle and not at the corner, um, until you stop putting makeup on while you're driving or on your cell phones or drunk driving, you know, uh, we would love to all see vision zero, yeah. um, but until you change that mentality, that's not going to happen. Well, what, what are, what, what is this program? What requirements are going to be on the city adopting a resolutions all, all nice and, and sounds good, but what do you want us to do to change? So, so really, I think the big, the big fallback on the cities and of course the TPO as we move forward is prioritizing safety, like we've always prioritized safety in our plans, but for instance, okay, it's one thing to say we prioritize safety. Our ITS, which is the 
digital stuff. I don't know. What is it? Information Technologies, I guess, that runs all the cameras and all that kind of stuff. Um, was our last plan completed. And instead of saying safety is number one, they took the high injury network that was developed during the Vision Zero action plan process and they actually made sure that those areas where let's say we have a higher rate of pedestrian crashes, the infrastructure will be, be beefed up so there can be technology put in there to help. There is also, as you talk about, human accountability here. So the safe systems approach, they look at angles. So Again, I know roundabout's a dirty word, but what a roundabout does is it makes people just a little bit uncomfortable, so they just naturally slow down. It eliminates left turns, which is one of the most dangerous turning movements we can make. The crashes, you might see an increase in crashes, but they're gonna scrape paint off of fenders. They're not going to be serious and fatal, The the which is not, a modern roundabout when we talk about it, but the traffic circle in Vieira gets labeled in the newspaper as the um, as the circle of death, and there has not been a single traffic fatality at that circle. It's, it's funny to hear you mention that because where I come from in New Jersey, they did away with all a lot of the traffic circles because it was such a problem, and now. Yeah, and there's a, there like is a difference between a traffic circle and a roundabout. But like I said, still, you're, and, and that's not the only, you know, there's a lot of stuff that DOT is looking at about chicanes where you, and so when you're, when there is a mistake, because we realize humans will make mistakes because we've been planning roads thinking everybody's going to do the right thing. When there is a mistake, it deflects the angle of impact. So it's not quite as great. So it seems to me that if all the cities can't get on the same page, you know, you talk about the cities making their individual decisions, but if we're not all consistent on the decisions we make and it's different from city to city, I don't, I don't think that sh is a good plan either. Well, and I, yeah, I would agree with you, and that's where when we made the decision to, to do this Vision Zero um, leadership team from a regional standpoint, that was kind of our thinking. If we get them all around the table and we're all talking about the same thing, you have a lot more opportunity to, to have consistency. So does Vision Zero have um, representatives from each city on, like, is this a committee that you have put together? Is it just made up of TPO people no. or? And that's one of the things in the resolution. If you become a Vision Zero city tonight, we would want somebody from the city whether it's, it's Christy or somebody that, that she designates or a police officer to attend those meetings. Again, they're every three months for a couple hours. So it's not a big, a big time crunch. It's not drawing somebody away every week, every month. It's every three months that we ask them to come and be a part of that. And we also have groups like um, Homeless Coalition rep represented on there. FDOT sits in there. You know, we want the right people in the room. Well, it seems like having a, a high-level person from our police force on, on that committee would be a good idea. Uh, it, are you taking more than one person on the committee from one city, or is it just... I'm more than happy to have more than one person. If you wanted more than one person from West Palmer to attend, um, Palm Bay has, has two people. So, yeah, the more people... I think if we do join this, that we should at least have one person from our City Hall, city hall and one person from the PD... Uh, to sit on the committee. I think that would be a great idea. Thank you. I'm happy to have uh, Mr. Dittmore. Thank you, Mayor. I can ask a couple quick questions for you. Are you tracking the alcohol-related injuries and fatalities? Yeah, that was actually on that chart. Okay. Um, because that chart came out of somebody telling me, oh, um, impaired driving's the worst. It actually was in the... I'm not saying it's not a problem, but if you look at it compared to distracted driving, it's, it's not as severe as, if you look at the bottom line, or the bottom chart there, impaired driving is, is the first category. Is, six, is 636 in 2020, am I reading this correctly? Yes, 600, uh, 636 mm -hmm. crashes that were attributed to um, impaired driving. And of course, impaired, impaired driving can be Again, not just alcohol, it's going to be alcohol, drug, or... But, but how do they determine distracted driving? Because that looks like about every other crash would be considered distracted driving. And, and it is difficult. And in fact, most of those crashes probably are not cell phones because people are not going to tell you if they get in a crash. Oh, I, you know, some people do. Well, I mean, how do they determine it's distracted? They just... yeah. 
when a when a police officer is taking the narrative and this you know they say oh I saw something or this or that um, that indicates that that driver was was distracted. And I I spent 11 years as a so police these, officer. So, yeah. yeah, I spent a few years myself. So I'm just <laughs> a little bit questioned about this. So, so we're, and I'm just for clarification. So this is like so this is there's 7,000 crashes here in 2021 in the county, correct? It's roughly, or is that total between no, everything? 13,000. Uh, 13,347 total crashes, that number across the- Okay, all right, I'm sorry, okay. Crashes, and then it's broke, I broke it down into- The 5,080, okay, it's distracted, okay. All right, so are you tracking the, uh, the, uh, the alcohol-related crashes as far as like time of day, things like these are happening? Do you guys track that by chance? We, we, certainly, we certainly can. I mean, we've, we've tracked, you know, we track as a whole with the Vision Zero process, we track time of day and things like that because Vision Zero, of course, looks at those serious and fatals. Okay. Um, and, and we do have that. And in fact, it, I, I'm almost 100% sure that that information is in our action plan so we can show you that. So I looked at, we had an email earlier from the, the chief had sent it out to everyone. We got, uh, we had uh, two fatalities that were listed out. I think it was 2021, but one of them happened about four o'clock in the morning. So, and, and didn't say it was alcohol related, but uh, and so much speed around 110 miles an hour down 192, I believe it probably was. Uh, the reason I'm concerned about that is the county uh, passed an ordinance here, I think it was last year, year before last, something like that, where they opened up the bars 24 hours a day. So I just gotta wonder if that's, uh, if anybody's tracking the alcohol related incidents with driving in that in those time periods normally it would be closed between two and six ish or whatever uh and i'm wondering if everybody's tracking that have you been had any guidance on that to track that or yeah, that's interesting you brought that up because that in the midst of COVID, that even that that slipped my mind that we probably should i know we're getting ready to look at the kind you know doing an, another set of data run because this is vision zero is based on data and that would be an interesting thing to look at yeah i'd be real curious about that for later thank you mm -hmm. Focusing on bicycles and pedestrian, and I'll include bicycles as the electric bike too, because they're getting pretty aggressive out there and you don't really hear them. And we know a lot of West Melbourne roads, either the city, the county, and the states, are really not designed for pedestrian traffic. So do you have any statistics on the people that have been injured or killed? How many of those accidents are, uh, driver fault versus somebody crossing in the middle of the road and, and those kind of things. Uh, no, I, w I would, I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy to pull it, but I don't have anything, you know, like that prepared tonight. Um, you know, the only thing that I can tell you is that 94% of them are user error, you know, which would, means that either the bicyclist, the pedestrian, the driver, whatever, did something wrong. One of the road users did something, um, that they weren't supposed to. And the other 6%? You know, I don't know. It's a thought, <laughs> I don't know. I guess it would be if there was, you know, a pothole, a medical reason, a pothole that formed in the road that they hit and caused them to go out of control, things, you know, just things like that. Yeah, medical, we do have, we have those. It just seemed if we knew who the, who we can educate more, the pedestrian, the bicyclist, or the driver, you can hone your skills in, into the, and, and, and we do look at that, and I, I do know that pedestrian um, fatalities, a good many of them are the fault of the pedestrian. Um, you know, and a, and a lot of those those folks are hard to get to, but we're doing we're doing everything we can to to get as much education out there as we can. Very good. Well, thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Informative. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor. All those in favor of resolution. 2022-11, signal saying aye. aye, aye, opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Melbourne Estates CDBG Flood Risk Reduction <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and esteemed Council. 
<laughs> this is the topic we all came here for this evening. All right, we are here for uh, to discuss the Melbourne Estate CDBD project. Um, excited to bring this forward for uh, just to go back to the audience or anybody who's not familiar with this project. Uh, up on the screen is the uh, the boundaries of the Melbourne Estate CDBG program going back to 2017. Uh, we had Irma come through and this neighborhood uh, unfortunately experienced some flooding. Uh, federal government made a pot of money available. Mr. Morgan, Mr. Mills uh, reached out, applied for some grants and uh, one of the grants that they were able to acquire $2.2 million for flood reduction into this neighborhood. Going through the CDBG project uh, process, which is challenging, um, they were also able to identify a different pot of money uh, with the CDBG program for a water line replacement. So it actually is two separate projects, flood reduction and water uh, line replacement. Uh, the water line replacement, $750,000, uh, put it together. The thought was do both projects, only rip up the neighborhood once uh, and, and give benefit to the community. Unfortunately, the CDBG process takes quite, a, quite some time and so some years have passed as we've been going, working with the state in order to get to this point. Um, and unfortunately for us, that caused the, the price of the project to creep up a little bit. So uh, in, as you might recall, we went out to bid uh, here earlier in this year and bid the project. Uh, we, we did have six companies come to the mandatory pre-bid meeting. Uh, unfortunately, only one company bid, uh, Young's Communication. They are a very reputable company. Uh, they have done some other CDBG projects for us. And so the good news is a good firm uh, came forward with a respectable bid. Uh, always like to see more bids, but, but um, this, is where, this is where we're at today. So the bid package, the bid price did come in uh, higher than anticipated. So the total uh, cost of the project was just shy of $6 million. Again, uh, we have $3 million in CDBG grant. We were gonna offset the rest with our ARPA funds, uh, with the project coming in, the bids coming in higher. We did reach back out to the state, had a good conversation with the state that did have some uh, funds that were unallocated and gave an impression that that would be something uh, that West Melbourne would qualify for and, and something that we should continue to pursue with them. Unfortunately, the process has now been in its fifth a week of them not being able to give us a direct answer on some of those funds. And so in an effort to keep this uh, moving forward in an effort to not lose uh, our 2.2 million uh, in our, our IRMA grant, uh, we do wanna mo move forward with the flood risk reduction part of this uh, project and continue to effort with the state to try to acquire the rest uh, or additional funds from the state for the water line side of it, but at least move forward with half of the project uh, this evening. And so um, I guess two items of note that I, I wanna clarify on this slide for the record, we would be looking at asking to approve bid items 12 through 25, which is the flood rates risk reduction. We requested that all bidders uh, put it into the separate projects for grant purposes for a refund and being able to keep the projects uh, straight uh, between the two different programs. Un unfortunately, we told them it was gonna be one project and um, as we're moving forward with just half of the project in order to make uh, the project a whole cost, the bidder, uh, YCOM is asking us to add in uh, bid lines one, three and four from the water project to combine with the flood reduction of 12 through 25 in order to get to $3.3 million, which is kind of the true cost of the project for them. Uh, we feel that that is uh, a very reasonable request and acceptable. We did, we, we did ask, you know, we did separate the projects and now uh, saying that they'd be one project and now we're only doing half of it. So, so that is a, a certainly a reasonable request. Additionally, we do feel good that we, we could get some money from the state and roll back in the water project. And so we hope to come in front of this council uh, three weeks from now or five weeks from now, hopefully three weeks from now, June 7th, and with, with some good news from the state with some additional funds and, and add in those other uh, line items for the water project. Uh, I do wanna add a special note that is something that's come up here in the last 24 hours. Um, 
we, we want to clarify that the contract, while approving, if, if the council moves forward with the flood risk reduction, we are not able to uh, sign that contract until we finish some of our uh, environmental impact clearance. Uh, we are still working with the, the, uh, the state on that, and we are expect that to get cleared any day now, but as of today, it is still not cleared. Uh, so this item, if we move forward, we would be able to uh, have the city attorney start working on some contracts, but we wouldn't actually be able to execute those contracts until we get that last document. Again, just a, just a paperwork item, uh, but something that we do want to note and something that we do. <coughs> Mr. Add. Rody, before you change oh. this. Before no. we change the screen. No problem. Out of the uh, one, three, and four uh, that we're adding on from the water project, one hundred and twenty-eight thousand dollars. Does any of that come out of the seven hundred and fifty thousand already allocated towards the project? Or I mean, that's the number in question, right? Yeah, uh, we we would we would not as of now um, we would be moving forward with this with a flood risk reduction grant money. <laughs> And not moving forward with the water project. So one point one would come out of the ARPA funds to fund this particular phase of the project. Correct. That's correct? What we're Is there a possibility that the water project could catch up to this and it still only affects the neighborhood one time? We that is the goal and that is what uh, if we don't have action from the state uh, by the second meeting in June, we'll be back in front of the council asking for some direction. On, on whether we continue to wait to see if the state has additional funds or possibly either walk away from the water project because the bid will probably be too, too stale in five weeks um, or move forward with the water project with ARPA funds. So we have, we'll have a couple options, but right now we're chasing, we're chasing a good probability of getting additional state funds that we wanna, we wanna keep our head down and keep focused on that for the water part. At what point do we lose to 750? thousand dollar grant if we walk away from the water project totally we would walk away from the 750 now the good news is the cdbg 750 uh, 750,000 is uh, a program that we'd be eligible for in the future that's an annual cycle of grant uh, process that we could go through the irma money is we, we either we either take it here uh, real quick or, or, or it's lost. We'd have to give it back and, and another community would be able to utilize it. So. Dittmore. Thank you, Mayor. Are we, are we still using the lights, Mayor, to, to speak or is it? Oh, okay. I just was checking. Okay. All right. Uh, I'd like to make a motion. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion that we approve. Uh, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought. Sorry about that. I make a motion that we, uh, we approve um, the uh, there it is. Hold on one second. Award the bid for the Melbourne Estate CBDG Blood Flood Reduction Project. I had my light on for so long, I, the screen actually went blank. Uh, in the amount of uh, $3,346,872. Thank you, Mr. Bachelor. Second. Mr. Dittmore, any discussion? No, no, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> okay, we have a motion, a second on the floor. All those in favor, signify saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you for bringing that forward. And our last item tonight is City Hall and Police Department monumental sign, monument sign. Good evening. Good evening. All right, so we brought you a really easy one to wrap up the meeting on. So moved. Um, so during budget discussions and other council meetings, uh, there has been some interest in uh, a new monument sign for City Hall and the Police Department on the opposite side of Minton. Uh, we do have $50,000 allocated in the budget this year. Uh, we also will be proposing um, additional in the coming year, depending on the outcome of this evening's uh, discussion. So what we're requesting right now is, is for council to make a motion on one of a couple of options uh, that either includes a digital message board component or does not include the digital message board component. There's a significant cost difference depending on which route you go. And so before we proceeded, we wanted to get some, some clear direction from council on, on what, the, what the desire was. So uh, what we have available is... Uh, None of the above. Is 
is this attachment that was included in the uh, staff report. So these are just for showing the difference between the two. Uh, these are not official renderings from uh, the sign company. The one on the right was from the community park, so we used that as the example of what that might look like. And then we just used the framing for that and then uh, laid in uh, a potential option that incorporates both city hall police and then the third building department building that will likely be a new address just north of city hall. So depending on the direction we received from council this evening, we would be able to engage several sign companies, request um, cost and rendering for something that would resemble uh, our existing city signs uh, here at the community park, but you know, with direction on with or without that uh, digital display component. As you can see there, the cost estimate, uh, 20 to 30,000 for a backlit standard sign, uh, or uh, 50 to 60,000 for one that includes uh, another electronic message board. Thank you, Mr. Bentley. Yeah, I was just, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Wondering why, why not just wait till we do the building department and decide then? I mean, that's a long way off. We had, we had money budgeted in this yeah. fiscal year, and so we were trying to move forward with the project uh, because it had been planned and budgeted. Um, excellent uh, option, though, if, if we decided we wanted to delay. Thank you. Mr. Dittmore. Well, Pat, you fouled me up here. Now it got me thinking about delaying it. So. <laughs> um, I don't even know where I'd put the sign right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, don't, I like that. I know we have a sign at the park, but I think a, a, a digital sign on the south, for the southbound traffic going down on Minton uh, by City Hall um, uh, would not be a bad idea. Um, you know, and I would be willing to make that motion that we, uh, we move forward with a digital sign because we have it on the northbound side. And there's really nothing instructive on the going southbound. Um, I guess if we we're going to do it, I think I'd just we'd spend the extra money. It's already allocated just to do the digital. Uh, I was going to make the motion. I'm going to hold off based on the fact of that uh, waiting to see. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't think that they're. I think what this is asking for is direction on whether they want to ex get quotes for a digital sign versus a non-digital sign, rather than go ahead and purchase a digital sign. Okay. I think it's both. I think uh, no, it's, it's, it's both. So we have the money allocated in this fiscal year. Yeah. So we're looking for direction on, on whether to go with the message board type sign or a more traditional standard sign using the funds that we have allocated already in, in this fiscal year. So where did the, the 50 to 60,000 cost estimate come from? Is it a WAG or is it? The, the, the community park sign was $50,000. But that was a number of years ago, and, and so we did get an updated estimate. The sign companies don't want to go through a bunch of design work and provide hard estimates if you're going to go get three proposals ahead of time. And so we were trying to narrow down the scope of what we're going to request. Okay, I understand that. But you, you, you approach the point that I was going to make is that a digital sign in 2022 is not going to be a dot matrix sign. It's likely to be an LCD sign in full color. And so perhaps this rendering does not do justice to what a digital sign will actually end up looking like. You're correct. So what is shown in that uh, rendering for the community park is what they call a 20 millimeter sign, which is the size of pixels and in relation, and so most sign companies have moved away from that. And so you're right that the, the text would be a little crisper than what you see there. 16 millimeter is pretty common these days. If you want to move up to a 12 millimeter, uh, that they would call it, it's it's even higher resolution. What they've estimated is every time you step up between those, you know, 20 to 16 to 12, add another three to six thousand dollars. Understood. Thank you. Yeah. So I would like to make the motion to determine that we would like to incorporate a digital message board for the City Hall and Police Monument sign. Thank you. And building department, right? Wait, is it? 
Say that again. Oh. Yeah, the, the nice thing with these is with, with that inlaid plastic, we can, if need be, later down the road, you can always adjust, you can replace the plastic piece. The expense is really the framing, the, the, the mm. stonework, the digital message board. That's where the bulk of the, the cost is going to come from. The plastic, in, yeah, exactly, the power. The inlaid plastic, if we added a building, we needed to you know, add a new address assignment to it, th those are a little easier to, to, to make those changes down the road, l less costly than, you know, the, the bulk of that would have already been there with... with Which one did you make the motion on? Digital. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Frampus. Thank you, Mayor. I'll second the motion. And uh, a, a question, um, are they, would they give us the cost differences in the quality of the pixels um, when you get the quote? Because, I mean, it's just determining what board they put in, right? Um, I know you said there's like right, 3,000. Right, so the 16, mm -hmm. the, what, what the gentleman on the phone it described to me, the, the company that had put this one in at the community park said, most companies aren't doing the 20 millimeter anymore, so they would likely be quoting the 16, which is pretty common for text. At what point would we have to make the decision on the quality we want the pixels to be at, the, the level? The, so what they recommended beyond, if you go beyond 16, you're looking at graphics displays, and I don't know that we had I mean, we're getting into a different age, and it might be nice to have that ability to do that if we wanted to. I mean, that, that's. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to go and you know t think about today. I want to think about the future. So, to have that ability to do th to do that, it would be nice. Sure. I mean, we're talking about three, six thousand dollars. Right. Um, seems so to be a small, small amount of money to be able to think about the future. Sure. Well, and we would be requesting quotes from several companies, and we would specify we're looking now for a, a, a sign with digital message board at. And that's what I said. Would this, they give us the option? 12 millimeter, of, you know, and, and get those proposals from several companies. Thank you. Mr. McDowell. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my question is basically this If I wanted to go with the lower cost solution, could I retrofit that digital later? I don't believe it would be any less expensive so, <laughs> to, to me, do it later than to do it now. Well, and I, I think just because we have the money available doesn't make it right. And I think that if we were strapped for cash, you know, we'd be asking the question, do we need that digital? Um, if there's a, it's like we're working backwards here. If there's a need, then that's fine. I get it. If we've got all this, you know, it just seems like we don't, we're not rationalizing what, what's the digital doing other than looking really cool. I mean, is it really going to be effective? And if it is, then is it worth twice the cost? So uh, that's where I'm struggling. Value. Well, and again, we have, we have 50 allocated in the budget this year, and their estimate was 50 to 60. And so there may need to be additional funding. So if if we were to go the route with the digital message board, we would need to probably do across fiscal years where we could begin the process now and complete the process after October 1 in order to have the appropriate funding to complete the entire sign. Now, if you went with the lower cost solution, obviously that takes a little less time to put together. Uh, they had estimated six to eight weeks for the non-digital and eight to 12 weeks for a digital uh, so that one, uh, you know, would fit within the budget this, this fiscal year, and we'd be able to move forward with it. The, the alternative, we would like to likely have to spread across the two years. Anything else, Mr. McDowell? Where exactly <laughs> will the sign be located? All right, so I will bring up Google Maps and show you an, show you an estimate. All right, so if you see the entrance here uh, from Minton to Judge Majid Way, it would likely be right in this area here. There's already a light pole with 
power here. And by putting, by placing it on the south side, mm -hmm. as you're coming on to Minton, you're not going to have your view obstructed by the sign as you're looking left for oncoming traffic. So this has been the uh, designated area at the, at the moment for where that would go. Okay. Uh, that's one good location. And the other question was, as far as a graphic sign, let's say we're missing a, or we're looking for a bank robber and he looks like whatever. Mayor. Is it, yeah, <laughs> common, common face. <laughs> uh, oh, that's funny. You didn't have your light on, by the way. <laughs> it is on. Uh, <laughs> so would it be useful to have uh, a picture being able to be posted and, and for certain things to uh, advertise? So if we were to, as Mr. Frampus was mentioning, if we were to go with the higher uh, quality digital display, uh, if we were to request that higher 12 millimeter that's great for graphics, then you'd be able to display pictures and text. Now it's not gonna be as crisp as you know a full HD screen, but as you're coming southbound on Minton, you'd be able to see it as you went past. and. Just a thought. Um, Mr. Bentley. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> um, seems, I, I'm just raising a question here. You already have a sign for this building, basically. You have a sign out there for the police station, sort of basically. Um, if you were to take this new sign and put it in front of the building department that we're going to build and you know, I'm in favor of buying the highest tech sign that you can get because it's going to be out of date within a year. Mm -hmm. So you want to start off as good as you can get. Uh, so I certainly want the highest resolution, best technology, at, at least at the time, uh, much like a computer. Then can you also use the building department to pay the, the cost of it since they're building the building? A portion would likely be able to be used for that. That would be probably a well, seems like the other legal question as to what portion would need to be. But it seems like they've already paid for signs, for example, in front of the police station. So they paid for, someone paid for a sign in the city. We've already paid for this sign here, so it just seems like the building hasn't yet. That would be the only building that hasn't paid for a sign yet, in my view. I think the answer is yes. Uh, <coughs> Deputy Mayor Young. Thank you. Certainly. Yeah. This is fine. I, I'm fine with whichever sign we go with. But I'm, I'm wondering, what are we going to put on that sign digitally that we don't already have in the sign we have? Now, thinking in the future, there may be other things. But the signs where you just show where it's going to be placed, the two signs are kind of staggered. Then you see the, the one, the new one, will, you'll, as you're coming south. Um, you would see that one first, and then you, you always want to look over to the one that's going to be on your left to see what's what the what the VMC sign is going to have as well. So you're trying to look at read them both, regardless if you're go if you're at the light and you're going northbound and you're at the light, maybe you can see them both. But if you're coming south, you're going to want to read them both, and you are coming to a light. Are we not causing more um, uh, distraction by having the two? moving signs there, whereas if we have one that doesn't move at all, then that's just a stag uh, stagnant sign, and you only have the one that you're trying to read, whether you're going north or south, because when you get down just a little bit further by the park, we have another digital sign. So between, do we really need three digital signs that will have some message tickering across them? Or are we fine with the two we have and just the regular static one sign is fine? I just, um, as I said, I don't mind if we have another one. I just don't see the purpose for it right now, even though I'm trying to be futuristic here. Anybody else on that? Mr. Dittmore. Thank you, Mayor. Um, to uh, the Deputy Mayor's point, I was actually going to bring this up about the distraction. So um, anybody going southbound, not look at the sign, the digital sign, as they're going southbound across the street? I mean, I do all the time. Is anybody else? 
I think pretty much everyone does. I bet you do. Anyways, um, I think it's a, I think it's a little bit of a distraction. So I mean, uh, and I understand what she's saying. We have these all these digital signs, but I thought if there's something on the right side, you know, um, it, you know, it might get someone to focus what's on the right side of the road as they're driving down rather than looking across over, which I'm guilty of doing it all the time, reading as I'm going by, looking at it. So I, I think it is a distraction for people going southbound looking over. Um, would that change if there was a sign across the street? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of on the fence on this whole thing right now at this point. So waiting, doing it now, what should we do, should we not do? Um, I, we, we need something. Uh, I just don't think we have enough to really to marking to the for City Hall for people that are going down here. If you're not from this area and you're, you're looking for City Hall, you could actually drive by it. So I drove by it at night. I did, <laughs> and uh, it does happen. So um, I wish I had a better answer. So thank you. Maybe the sign you're talking about on near Judge Majid Way should just be one direction, be less distracting and half the price maybe. Mr. Bachelor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm on the side of um, uh, Councilmember Ditmore. On I, I would be convinced that this would be less distracting because the the side of the road should be within your peripheral vision of driving on that side of the road anyway. Whereas you would potentially have to turn your head uh, and not be looking at the road in front of you, and become a distracted driver if you are looking across the road um, at some some text in the dark. Of course, a digital sign will be naturally illuminated. Uh, and if you remember back to the discussion about how this came up in the first place, it's exactly your point. Where is the police department and where is City Hall? And that's the whole point of the sign. Um, and of course, it being digital means that we can rotate quite easily the information that's being displayed to announce special topics at the park. And yes, there is another digital sign further down the park because you need to tell somebody more than once about an event for them to remember it. Um, and then, um, yeah, who else is going to tell everybody that there's a new pickleball court? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Bentley. Thank you, Mayor. Also, I would point out that I don't know what the completion date is of the new building. <laughs> right. Do you? I do not. If you had to guess, do you know the month? We don't know the year. year? <laughs> I could probably be closer on year. Give me the month. year. <laughs> <coughs> Give me the year. I'm serious. Give me the year. Is it next year? Unlikely. By 20, 2023, 2020, 2023. All right, 2023. Well, I'm not sure. And I, you know, I sit up here like everybody else. So um, I do know that we're serious about it to build a new building department building. And there's been discussion on the second floor of different things that could go there. One was maybe a senior, maybe, maybe some kind of community center. I don't know, we haven't gotten that far and we really haven't made much progress on, I think on even going forward, but uh, I think we will soon. And I hope this sign would serve that community building whatever as well, but I, I really don't even know what that looks like yet or if it will have a second floor, or who's gonna win that discussion. Um, I just think this is early. I mean, I, under, I understand it's in the budget, but you know, I don't wanna build a sign and then a year later have to build another sign because now we've got a new facility. Um, if you can get one that's, I, want it, I do want it very high tech because then you're also gonna to have to cover any, for example, you do a community center there, you may wanna list, hey, here's the events going on today at the center. I don't know. I mean, yeah, all good points. And I think, um, you know, I think the initial discussion about a sign across the street may have even occurred before the discussion about a building department, a right? building department building. And so but things have it may again have been sort of in motion before sure. that had had been discussed. And so excellent. And, point. and so I just want to make sure I'm not doing this because I've got the money and you were asked to do it. I want to make sure this is the right time to do it and that we're encompassing something that we really haven't even decided what we're gonna do over there yet. Whether it's one story, two story, whether it has council over there or not, I don't know. Um, so I'm kind of in the favor of, let's just wait on this and get at least closer to finding out what are we gonna put over there and is this sign going to apply to that or not? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. McDowell. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, just want to clarify, though. We have on the table a motion and a second to purchase or to at least go forward with a digital sign. Is that the, what's out there? Okay, I can support that. What we don't know is where. And we're, we would still, the motion would still carry in the current state without a location? I think he gave us a quasi location. Okay, but I'm gonna support that because I'm convinced now we should just do the full blown digital. Hmm. I would think maybe we should just put some little extra money in the budget for next year and incorporate it until we can, uh, obviously we had 27 people, 27 times going back and forth here, so we're not real clear on our direction. Uh, Mr. Frampus? Well, this is my first, so. Now, you um, made the I, motion. I, I, in the motion, so go ahead. You're right, but um, I don't understand the argument on the the building department because we can take an account that we can incorporate the building department into the sign before we build the building department. I mean, we can still, if we're, I, I just, I don't understand that argument that maybe you can clarify on that a little bit more, but we can build this and fund it. And if, and if part of the, if we're going to say the building department's going to get utilization of the sign and it's it's forthcoming I don't understand why the building has to be built before the sign so I miss mr. Morgan is that is that right the building department is there and if we build a building department there it will still be there and so your argument is exactly right all right anyone else we're here at 30 all right, we have a motion on the floor and a second to build the, uh, or construct the, uh, mon the monument sign, the one on the right, the digital message board. And I think that includes the upgraded version, digital pictures, movies, and everything else. Okay. That is... Okay, movies. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a movie. The upgraded digital message board is is what I heard. Yes. And it, and according to our city code, it can't flash more than once every second. I think it says, but uh, you'll want to be in charge of that. All right. All those in favor of passing this, signal for saying aye. 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 Opposed. Nay. Motion passes six to one. With Mr. Bentley voting nay. Mr. Mayor. Um, is, is the position of the sign still up for discussion? Uh, I mean, we're, we're not set on that yet, right? Is that right, Tom? I mean, as far as where the sign gets put, because I, I do agree with Mr. Bentley that it may be beneficial to have it down closer to City Hall. And I mean, are we removing the police department sign that's currently there? So yeah. while we don't have plans yet for the building, uh, I don't know that there's going to be another entrance further down here that it, it's with Minton. So the sign near this main entrance was what we had in mind. I agree. But if it's quite a bit further down, it's not going to block the view coming out, make it on left. If it's towards the north side of City Hall, it's not going to block the view coming out of that entrance there. Here you mean? or If here? it's up to the north of City Hall, yeah. there up. Where, isn't that where you were talking, Pat, that where the other, There's a lot of trees. where the building department would be? I, I just don't know exactly where that building's going to sit. Well, it's going to sit in that triangle, but obviously. It's be in that area. Yeah, well, it, obviously, if we're going to put the sign in, it would have to be somewhere in that yeah. median there. Yeah. So, I just think there should that. be a little more discussion on that. Could, I don't think we can install that sign down there without electricity, and you'd want to incorporate that with getting electricity from the parking lot or someplace, right? I would think. Right. Yeah. The, the, the reason this was selected again it was but for the entrance and the power here. There's no lighting on that median anywhere. Um, I don't know that there's any down. No, it's dark down there. It's always dark. Maybe we should. That's have. why I drove by it. That's <laughs> how I drove by it at night. I'm telling you, it's, it's very dark over here. It just is. 
Hopefully the sign would light it up then. It'll light it up. Are we sure there's enough easement or clearance where you have your cursor there to put that big monument sign? We, we did measure that out and it, and it 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 does appear that it's going to fit and, and not obstruct sidewalk or, or drive on either side. Mr. McDowell? I make a suggestion that we have you come back with some rational think, I mean, kind of give us a matrix that says, here's your options. And at least that way we can kind of digest it. Or if it's going to be left up to the council to put a sign placement, I would want some. I mean, they know uh, these sign folks probably have a good idea. And you can tell us whether it's going to cost more, if it's going to be put over in a place that doesn't have electric, all the variables that are associated with it. We uh, probably should not have voted not knowing where we're putting the sign. To me, it's kind of like that it should have gone hand in hand. We should have had an idea of sign, put it here. Now we could have a sign with no location. It's a mobile sign. So, so again, the, the designated area that we had pre-selected was this area here, just based on not obstructing the view as you're entering Minton and also having access to power. Um, but well, if, if, if that's not the desired location, we could consider alternatives. I apologize for that. If that's if that's the location, I'm perfectly good with it. That's great. But I'm not getting that feeling that it was. Yeah, I mean, I really like the north the north part of our property. Closer to low is better, but that's what I think. Okay. We can make that decision, right? I mean. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you'll bring us something back if that's even feasible. At least, at least two options. Okay. Please. Certainly. All right, Mr. McDowell. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. All right. Brings us the city council reports. Mr. McDowell, you're up either way. Great. Thank you. Um, I want to say to uh, uh, Council Member. Uh, Dan over there, listen, uh, thank you for everything uh, you've done, and I know you were um, instrumental in my decision mm -hmm. to run, so now they everybody knows that uh, at the donut shop. But I wanted to um, also say that I'm going to miss that ability to say, oh, you mean the other Dan that was taking care of that? So uh, you've been a good deflection for me. Uh, I'll miss that. Uh, what I was going to say on my report today is that uh, I'm not going to talk about the different meetings I've gone to, but I wanted to touch just very quickly on the report from April 19th on that sustainability. And uh, I had time to go through it, and I was able to... Um, review a lot of the content. It's a lot of detail. There's um, some concern that it was kind of associated to the United Nations, and I agree that it was, you know, this is about River City. This is about right here in this town, and it's uh, about sustainability, and it's about different uh, items within sustainability that we would like to address. And what I would like to um, ask permission from the council is that I already have uh, pretty much dissected it and you know there's uh, roughly 10 to 12 different variables and two of them we wouldn't even, uh, it's not applicable and three of them, you know, we're well on our way. I'd like to summarize all that into, a, you know, a one pager so you can kind of see what that looks like and uh, then decide that if we could bring that up maybe at that workshop or something like that, if everyone's comfortable with that. I do not want to, I mean, without the detail, I couldn't have been able to do that. So I really appreciate the efforts, but I do think we can, you know, encapsulate this if the council's comfortable with that. Does that mean we're not going to lead the way for third world countries? I'm just checking his task in, so. <laughs> How long a time do you want? Are you calling for a special workshop or? No, no, not at all. Actually, I'm, I, I would have had it tonight if I uh, just had 30 more minutes. I would have, because uh, I have already have the information. It just needs to be formalized. And I can put that together for whenever we're doing our review of those other 15 items or. 
you know, you can kind of just take a look at it or leave it on an agenda for July. I mean, it's up to the group. Yeah, I don't know if we have time during those 15 because I think he's presenting his uh, state of the city, whatever <laughs> feature during that time. So, I mean, I don't know if we do. I just do. would hate to see all that hard work just not be addressed or at least have some uh, further steps to look at because there is a lot of different variables that, you know, we don't need to talk about resilience. We've done a great job in that area. And, you know, that's what I'm going to be able to kind of outline a little bit better as to what are the opportunities. Yeah, I don't Also, maybe we have a shorter meeting coming up might fit in there. So if we can target for July and we end up in September, then so be it, you know. But if I can at least get it on the uh, future agenda, I appreciate it. Thank you. About the first meeting, our, our next meeting is, I don't know what the agenda is like on that. But. I have no idea. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll have it ready into the uh, uh, Mr. Morgan's office for next month. And if it doesn't hit next month, then it'll be the next month after that, or the next meeting after that. All right. Okay? Very good. Thank anything, you. Anything else? Nope, we're good. Thanks. Councilmember Stephen Frampus. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, um, just got a comment and a, and a question. Uh, I just wanted to thank Mr. Rohde for he um, and the city, obviously, for sending him out. He came out to uh, the board meeting at Sawgrass Lakes and presented the new um, uh, the construction project to expand the lanes, and and he did a good effort out there and. And uh, I know all the residents out there really appreciated the, the information he brought with him. Um, and, and through his effort, the community coordinated a project and removed a lot of the stone off the tower that's being removed. And, and we're able to preserve that stone and use it towards uh, additional, uh, as additional cost savings for projects down the road. So it, it, it's nice that the city's working with the community to go hand in hand to uh, get this project done. Um, my other thing also involves Mr. Rohde. Uh, we, we approved to go move forward with a contract for him um, for the next city manager's position. And I was curious of how that process works. And, and uh, I had questions and, I, and I'm assuming I wanted to hear the input from all the other council members. And I didn't know how we go about that. I mean, I, do, do I f send my suggestions to Mr. Richardson and he can allow all the council to see everybody's suggestions? That way we can think about everything. I know we're not talking together, so I don't know that that's a sunshine violation, that we know what everybody's thinking. Um, and, and we don't, we're not, we just communicated at the next meeting or something or, or through back through Mr. Richardson. Um, I'm a little, this process is a little weird to me, um, but I know I had questions and and I just kind of wanted some direction since this is my first time with this process. I think I think what what we should do is, and some people have already, is give your thoughts and ideas to the city attorney. He represents us, and he'll negotiate with the. Uh, but to, for him to put it in a contract when we all have different ideas and then we <coughs> wouldn't it be better to formulate those ideas into one that's what he'll process do. and then put it in the contract and i i am doing that i'm sort of distilling the essence of it and because some ideas are common and there's a, a common thread and uh, most of council seems interested in those and other ideas are, are sort of outliers that maybe someone could bring up in, in discussion, but uh, the contract I bring will be one that's based on what I think the consensus of council. But I mean, there might have been ideas presented that we didn't think about and we left it out because it was an outlier, but it might be agreeable to everybody. Well, couldn't that be brought up during... Because we all have to approve that contract. No, I know, but um, I didn't know if there was... Yeah, there's no mechanism to have any back and forth outside of a public meeting. Would you light on? But, hold on. My light's on, Mayor. Good. Anybody okay. else? No. Everybody. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I wasn't done yet. No, I'm just, no, I was just going to throw in. Just throw in. <laughs> Would it be uh, feasible for you to put those uh, ideas uh, out to all of us uh, as, and then we could take a look what the other ideas are that people have, Mr. Richardson, and just and we could get back to you and say we think this is important. That way we all would know what some of the other ideas are and then we could let you know if we thought it was important or not. Isn't that what he would do when he gives us a sample contract? Well, no, I mean, it, well, because he's going to pick out, he's going to separate the outliers. And I'm saying this way he could just kind of say these are some of the things that are brought up. And the common threads are these, and these are some of the outliers, and then we, then we could take a look at it and get back to them. Is that, uh, it's not sunshine there, because we wouldn't really know who's saying what. Yeah, probably the closest I can get to that is um, a staff report that references some considerations. Okay. Well, I mean, we still have months and months, so but we need to get it done, but it doesn't have to be done yesterday. Yeah, I'm planning on bringing it next month. <laughs> I guess a month. on top of it. <laughs> Before the completion of the building, department building. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Daniel Bachelor. No report? Thank no, you. go. Oh, no not going to let you off that easy. <laughs> Wow. These people didn't wait around for you to say no report, okay? I, I said it all earlier. I'm, I'm just, Some of them came in late. I'm, well, I'm, I'm very grateful to the residents for them placing um, their faith in me to represent their best wishes and uh, their, 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 their um, vision for the city. Uh, thank you to the city staff again for your excellent executive powers. Um, thank you to you all on the dais and I uh, wish you all the best. I think the city has got tremendous potential. It's going in the right direction. There's very healthy debate amongst this group. I, I'm very proud of that. Um, I think we um, represent a, a wide range of um, opinions on how the city should be, uh, the direction that the city should go in, and uh, we, we do come to a consensus, in, and that's, that's good, whether, whether or not I'm on the the majority or not, and uh, that's the way the process works. But no, I'm going to actually come and sit here uh, on on June. I'm serious. I probably yeah. I'll still be in. I'll be in. I'll be living in the area. I will. <laughs> just not a West Melbourne. Not just not a West Melbourne resident. So. <laughs> yep. Yep. I'll try and get myself thrown out of the session by the mayor. Actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why wait? No. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the gavel hasn't fallen just yet, has it? Yeah. All right. But once again, yes, I'm eternally grateful, and thank you, everybody. And uh, I will be keeping in touch. And uh, if you have, if you want to reach out to me for anything, uh, June the first, I'll be here to say whatever I want to whomever I want, without the attorney being involved. Yeah. <laughs> That's true, right? He, he Yeah, he nodded. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's your takeaway, right? <laughs> That's my final comment. Yeah. The attorney will not be involved <laughs> on June the first. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Council Member John Dittmore. Thank you, Mayor. Just uh, one thing. I was, uh, last Thursday, I uh, participated in a town hall meeting down in Melbourne. Our state representatives, as well as our uh, Debbie Mayfield, our uh, state senator, was there. Uh, we got to hear from several residents uh, in the Brevard County area regarding some of the uh, Florida property insurance issues that are going on. And uh, they have uh, uh, promised to take some of those issues back to them, uh, to the go back in session to help resolve some of the uh, the, the crisis that we have here in the state of Florida that uh, I don't know if it's, it's not going to be an easy fix uh, and it's going to continue for a while. And uh, if most of us, if not all of us, have, have uh, felt that, uh, that crunch a little bit is what's taken on. And, and many, many of our insurers are leaving the state or they are no longer solvent. They become insolvent. And uh, it's becoming a huge problem in this county. And uh, we are now being rated with some of the other counties that are known for some fraudulent activities. And um, and that's affecting their property insurance across the board. So anyways, I did participate in that. And uh, it was a good meeting. And uh, hopefully uh, they'll uh, take something back to Tallahassee with them. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Pat Bentley. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I do want to say bye to Dan. I'm sincerely going to miss Dan. Uh, and I also feel your pain, well, feel your pain in two ways. 
One is I lost a vote tonight, six to one, so I understand some of what you've seen in your perspective. Also, I saw and envisioned a golf cart community that was completely picture different than I think what we're going to see uh, based on what I heard tonight, and that is so disappointing. And, and you were the one, one of the, probably the only one that at the time uh, pushed us to not give further concessions, even though we did give a concession. And uh, only if we could take some of those back. Uh, so thanks for that. Also, I would point out there's a mayor's breakfast on Friday. Uh, if you're signed up for it, that should be a really fun event. If you haven't been to, to one of these style events, they're, they're really worth going to. And then I would just also point out to the staff that I'll be out of town next week, but I'll still be available by phone. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Young. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say thank you to the council for approving Vision Zero. Thank you very, very much. It's a big part of my TPO meetings. Um, and I also wanted to um, also say thank you, Dan. Thank you for everything that you have brought, all the laughs and the groans that you have brought to this council. Uh, you've been very wise indeed, and it's been a, been a pleasure to serve with you. I don't have a whole lot more. That's the end of my report. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I, too, want to thank Dan again, Dan number one again, for uh, for being here and sharing his wisdom and again making us all just dig a little deeper and think about things a little stronger so and even though you won't be on council uh, you left a uh, a lot for us to work on and uh, we appreciate it and i wish you good luck in your new place and now you have something to hang on your wall so <laughs> So this last couple of weeks, uh, Palm Bay uh, City Council had uh, 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 Palm Bay City Council, uh, Palm Bay Chamber had a uh, the speaker was Senator Debbie Mayfield, and again she did a great job on just explaining a lot of things that went on during Senate uh, during their Senate uh, time and. Also, obviously, she talked about insurance and what she's going to do with that, and uh, she really seems like she's listening uh, to all our constituents lately. I mean, she always has, but it seems like every function I go to, she's there lately, the Space Coast League of Cities, and she's there, she's visible, and uh, if you have any questions or problems, call her office, because she will definitely uh, have somebody follow up and send you in the right direction. Uh, I have got a lot of calls here lately, and I've seen a lot is the panhandler situation. We're getting more and more of those uh, all over. I don't know what we can do about that. If anything, there some of them on the middle of me, middle of the median, some of them on the sides, some of them are in parking lots. So, uh, are we doing anything with that lately? Is it? Anything more? Okay. I mean, the police department is enforcing pedestrian laws as previously. So are there any more specifics about the last time I received a call, it was for someone at Eber and Babcock, which is in Melbourne. Uh, I have noted it uh, a shopping center and a parking lot on private property, some recent panhandling activity, we uh, private property owners can address that through a private property owner's trespass affidavit if it becomes a, a nuisance or problem there. Haven't noted uh, much on streets. Maybe Chief can say more about streets within West Melbourne. I see them on North Fork Parkway in the corner there. I see them on 192. I see them on over the, yeah, all the time there and just they're getting more and more aggressive. So I guess it's something we need to look at. Also, I know it's very dry out there and we haven't had any rain, but more and more complaints about reclaimed water not working, especially in Hammock, one of the Hammock Landing lakes. lakes. Hammock Lakes that doesn't have much of a lake now. So, uh, I guess people are watering out of time. Are you having the same trouble in your neighborhood too? I mean, Well, yeah, just uh, some of the neighbors are complaining about, and I did take a drive through Stratford Point, and then uh, usually they, Usually the, what we hear is is that uh, Stratford Point's using the water when they're not supposed to be, but when the pressure dropped, I was over, I drove through Stratford Point, and I didn't see that one yard on. 
So I couldn't figure out what was going on with the actual pressure. So I, I'm, I'm not really sure I was going to talk to staff about that this week. But yeah, we'll, we'll check with uh, Jacobs to see if there was something on our end. Do they measure gallons per hour, the flow, or something like that? Uh, um, pounds per square inch leaving the plant. So we sent mm -hmm. it out 105 PSI, which well, is very high pressure. I understand that. I'm just looking at gallons delivered. So if they're well, met. Yeah, we, we, we know how much um, is consumed in so, the cycle. So I'm just I'm trying to figure out if maybe is there a leak somewhere because there's something going on because it literally drops off to nothing and it's not being used anywhere. I couldn't find anywhere in Stratford Point. So it, it's either we're not delivering it or there's a leak somewhere where it's going is not supposed to be going. Yeah, if you've got a, a date, we can go back and check our. Yeah, well, we can go back to the last two days, last two delivery dates, Wednesday, Saturday. So. I think I'd rather look forward and see why it's not working and what can we can do about it because the complaints I'm getting, they're obviously not getting pressure. So, and they think there's a break in the line or people are using it off cycle or something, so odd and even. So I don't know, are we enforcing that at all? We haven't been. We certainly can. Uh, our initial enforcement kind of at this time of the year, it's actually usually a little earlier. It's been drier longer this spring um, is sort of the friendly reminder. Then we get into the rules that are referenced by the code, you know, where the first one um, is an official warning, and then you get a $25 fine, and it goes on. You end up at the code board um, for those that, you know, don't abide by the rules. So we have had cards printed up for code enforcement to do that. Uh, we haven't done that yet this cycle, but we can certainly uh, assign code enforcement to uh, remind people of the odd and even cycle. Probably good to do before rainy season because then it won't matter. But just, I know some people just haven't turned their clocks, their timers, and it just, we need to look at that. That's all. Um, Splash Park, I know it's been down for close to a year now. When is the ribbon cutting and the opening of that? I know we've, we've the footers, um, I, I don't know exactly where that project is. It, it's under construction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the what what they had run into was um, the they need to ground the um, structure underneath it with the concrete, and so th there had to be some additional work done that wasn't planned initially, which has pushed it back. We needed a change order to to make that happen, and so that's been taken care of. And so uh, we were thinking mid May was when that was going to be completed, but now you're looking probably early June. Okay, is it? They just dug the footage in the wrong place, or they had the wrong. No, they, they the building department had identified an, an issue that required some additional grounding uh, to make it safe, mm -hmm. to make sure that in the event that there was some kind of a lightning strike, that there was some, or some some electric coming off, it, it's all properly grounded underground uh, under the. Concrete. Is the surface finished and the the mechanical stuff all working now? So the, the new control board has been installed. Uh, we're going to have to, once that uh, surface is done and the canopy structure is installed, the health department's going to have to come out because after a certain period of time, if you haven't been operational, it's almost like starting a whole new one and they have to go through end to end every detail and, and so it's a more thorough inspection and so that'll have to occur. So added a little bit of time there. Uh, as the result, and so we're looking at early June. Okay, thank you. Also, uh, are we having any organized sports at the park or the Field of Dreams this summer? <laughs> Come on up, if you would. <laughs> sure, uh, Mr. Bopri would be be better to speak to that. There are some some new programs that have been in place. There. Uh, so there are a couple of schools that are out at the park. They've closed the Field of Dreams Park uh, today. They'll be doing it again tomorrow to allow the schools to have access uh, for the for the park area. And then he also has a couple. It'll be coming out in the Friday memo, additional detail about that. But there are some programs that are coming. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to know what, what kind of uh, organized programs they're having for families that want to use that. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, and, and it'll be in this Friday memo. So there'll be additional detail. Uh, Mr. Bopre and I spoke today about that. Okay, very good. Also, there's seven days left to school, so drive carefully. You know how the kids are uh, as they exit 
the premise, and I guess the last three days or half days. So um, it's it's exciting time for a lot of these kids. We do have a lot of graduates from Mel High and different schools around here, so we wish them well as well. So that's all I have. Any questions for city manager, or city attorney? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. See you uh, June 7th.